I mean, it's only, I mean, I've never talked about Faulkner's before, if I'm honest. But what I've got is I've got a copy of the old Commander's Diary, and I've, I've been through reading it the last few days, and and just sort of so just to remind myself, I think because you you forget what happens, don't you? It's uh, so yeah. I've, well, let's let's get straight into it, mate. Yeah. All right. If you're if you're happy, you might as well. We, we, yeah. Well, let's start anyway. Um, when you say Commander's Diary, what which commander? CO3 para. So wherever you go, there's a Commander's War Diary. And uh, yeah, whichever operation you go on, it's the normally the adjutant's job to uh, to keep a commander's war diary. And there was one, you know, written obviously for the Falklands, and I didn't find it until I was in charge of the um, I was in charge of the rear ops group for Herrick 13. And uh, yeah. I was rooting around because I was working out the adjutant's office, and uh, I found this I found this folder in this thing, and it had a in true three para style, it had like this uh, it had this yellow post-it stuck to the top of it saying never to be lost that was it i was like hmm. <laughs> you know I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a better copy of this somewhere but probably not no knowing so, that knowing our lot this is colonel pike's diary yeah this is hugh pike yeah colonel From hugh pike yeah so, so yeah so every day every time you go on an operation somebody's tasked to keep a diary and there will be a copy of that diary and it tells you every little thing that happens and you'll be, I mean, you'll be amazed the detail some of it goes into, and it's as well, it's as good as the you know the person who's writing it, and obviously censored by the CEO and checked by the CEO to make sure that all the relevant information's there, and it's it's an amazing document. Yeah, I'm just wiping my camera. Yeah. yeah. Um, how old were you when you when you deployed to the Falklands? Then? Uh, I was 18. Um, you know, I joined the army. You know, less than two years before. Um, I mean, I joined Junior Parachute Company at 16, which is, you know, what, you know, before they have the sort of the thing at Arrogate now. You used to have a Junior Parachute Company that went direct to Aldershot and you were guaranteed yeah. to sort of go in the Parachute Regiment. So at 15, I got a guaranteed vacancy certificate, joined down in uh, Aldershot. And I think the term was sort of 10 months. You did 10 months as, uh, as in juniors. And then from there, you went straight into Recruit Company at week eight. You joined anybody who had joined a normal Recruit Company straight from Civvy Street. And in our case, we had quite a few TA guys at the time, or reserves as we're calling them now, uh, and then passed out in September 1981. So I went to three para, two platoon A company, three para, in Tidworth. Oh, right. Yeah, it's a bit of a bit of an eye opener. I've got to say, it's. Uh, what it was, was right. uh, <laughs> what was what was what was the reg like back then? What was it like? Going, tell me, like, because I know what it's like now. Or when I joined for a new bloke, like a Joe bag to get the battalion. Yeah. What was it like then? What was what was that experience like of joining the Reg in 1981? It, it, it was the same view, probably, you know, but, um, you know, back in them days, no, nobody used to talk to you. You were a crow. I mean, I, I never forget getting off a four-tonner in uh, in Tidworth. We travelled down in a four-tonner down from Old Shot. We got off. It was around lunchtime. So they took all the crows, a big gang of us, lots of us, into uh, the cookhouse. Everybody stopped talking. They, you know, they, everyone was like, their eyes like boring into you. You know, or you know, fresh meat. Here they are, thinking, "Oh no!" You know, I think it's like any any new recruit, you know, a new arrival in battalion. You just can't wait till the next lot turn up, can you? You know, because then the pressure's off. But uh, but no, it it was good. I mean, I I got in, you know, with the guys in the in the company in the platoon. Yeah, once they got over the initial bit of, you know, you're a crow, don't forget it. It's uh, it, you know, they look after you. You know, they take you under their wing. There's some really good guys in there. You know, within within the platoon and within the company, that that do that, you know, and uh, and help you through that initial difficult time, because because it is all new and it's you know it's all totally different to um, being in depot when everything is done for you. You know, every, you know where you're going, what you're doing, everything else. Obviously, battalion, it's all a little bit. Well, hang on, you know, you're grown ups now and you're supposed to know that. But of course, as a crow, you can't ask, and you and you and you don't want to ask. You don't want to bring attention to yourself. <laughs> you just want to. Yeah, you want and to then, fade into the background. And then you get the people who, who take advantage and take, you know, the bastards take advantage and just beast you. But that, mate, oh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you're making me remember now when I came up. It's yeah. like uh, you go through depot and it's like day one, week one, depot. You go, oh, you got a clue. And as you go through depot, or for you, like junior para, as you go through all that, yeah. you become a bit longer in the tooth. You know, you do P company, you do jumps, you're like, yeah, I'm the man. And then you get on that four tonner to, to battalion 
And then yeah. it's like, oh no, it's all the same, except it's worse because yeah. those people they're 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 red blocks. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my god. Oh, it was it, it was you know. I mean, my bed when I got into my room when they showed me where my bed space was, my bed was right next to the door and it was up against the wall, and uh, and obviously they pulled it down, so everyone who had to come into the room had to walk round my bed now. Only they didn't. They just walked over the top of it. <laughs> it was like, and I couldn't go, hey, what are you doing? Get off my bed, right? You know, because it wasn't playing. You know, so it was just, uh, I think it's, you know, you just try and get that initial bit out of the way, you know, find a friendly face, you know. And like I said, in the end, once they've sort of calmed down with the excitement, having a new bloke in the company and in the platoon, they, you know, they do look after you. And I mean, a week later, yeah, we were in France. We went, you know, I was a, I was a scruffy little kid from bloody a council estate. I didn't have a passport or anything. I mean, there's, there's loads of things going on about, you know, when was the first time you sort of, um, uh, you went in a plane? You know, did you have to jump out of it sort of thing? Well, yeah, because you get the initiation flight or the, you know, the trial flight round Bryce. Normally, it's like your second one. And but I'd never been abroad. Never been abroad as a kid because we couldn't afford it. And uh, a week after I got to battalion. We were going to France, so I was in France. A week after that, two of the blokes in the company killed a bloke downtown. I was thinking, what the bloody hell? Oh, my God. On? Yeah, yeah, they've got five years. It was outrageous. Well, I was, scrap it. Scrap yeah, it. Yeah, somebody took him down an alley. Yeah, come with me. You know, I'll show you where the chicks are and all that sort of thing. And then pulls a knife on him, tries to get their money, and obviously lost that fight. And But it went a stage further. And, uh, yeah, these two oh, guys so got killed. Some civvy tried to mug them. Yeah, they ended up filling him in, and he got and he got killed in the process. Yeah, he, he died in the process. Yeah, so Jesus. Yeah, so you know we'd been playing football in the afternoon. It's quite funny looking back on it now, although a bloke died. Yeah, you know, but you know <laughs> we came off a football pitch and we had to walk round the corner. He said, right, one at a time, go around the corner. Some ages at the top of the thing, you know, and this is an ID parade. I'm thinking, what the bloody hell? So I'm hobbling around. They were looking for a bloke hobbling. Everyone's in football boots, so you had to walk <laughs> around the corner. And there was this French whore on this like balcony. Like doing this ID parade and picking blokes out if it was them. You know, like, bloody Nora. Oh, it was in France it happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While we were oh, there. God, yeah. God, I didn't realise. Yeah. Heck. So yeah, so this woman was there doing this doing this ID parade as I was thinking. I'm only like seventeen and a half years old. I was thinking, what the bloody hell is going on? It's like this is crazy. This is mug. But um but yeah. That was that was like my initi initiation into three part. It was great. It was uh, it was good. Yeah. The similar stories have been told since, I reckon. <laughs> hey, look, you know, it's, it's it, the stories that go around, you know, and yeah, they're all they all, all of a similar nature, aren't they? And then some of them go, yeah, there's some that you think that's outrageous, that is, but you you think, yeah, I know a bloke could do that. Yeah, that's. I, I, I remember, I remember a guy. I, you probably know him actually. I won't, I won't say the name, but I remember a guy, and he got a he got a commendation, a CEO's a CEO's commendation or something like that. And he was in the local press in, in Colchester because uh, because he had he had found someone who had been beaten up in town. He found him. He put him in a recovery position and then called and called the ambulance. It was him that beat him up. <laughs> <laughs> he think your neck you get. He got in a scrap. Like did this guy in the guy's got just flat and gone. Oh, I found this guy in flipping neck. Yeah. So <laughs> you got the death. You got the battalion when. I got to battalion in September 1981. Uh, when when did the whole so Falklands deployment was March or started March 82, right? No, April. It started so, April. So the the first sort of inkling was early first week of April. You know when we first sort of got it, it all kicked off and there was a I think there was some probably rumblings in the background, but the first it came out really was the, that the Argentinians sort of attacked. The Falklands. You know. Before that, Paul, sorry to interrupt, before yeah. that, in, in 81, can you remember any, any? there's always a, there's always these days, and it's obviously we're, we're much more connected and much more immersed in, in media and news. There seems to be always like a build up. You can see it now. There's always yeah. a build up to, to a conflict. You can see oh, something and it gets, there's more friction. It gets heats up, heats up, heats up then something happens. Was yeah. there anything like that? Can you remember as, just as, as a as a member of the public and as obviously a soldier in the news? Yeah. Was it like things ain't looking good? Yeah. No, I don't. I don't think there was. I mean, remember there's a there was a small detachment down in the Falklands, the Royal Marines. Uh, I can't even remember how many there were, but it's very small. And of course, communications weren't what they are now. You know, if you, I mean, when you start looking 
yeah, a little bit ahead of it, really. But when the recall procedure came through for us, to, they were saying, well, you know, you might be involved in this because at first it was only us and two parents that came in later on. But you know, we were recalled by telegram. You know, we've been sent away that weekend. You know, they decided they were going to send us away for the weekend. And uh, you know, we were recalled by telegram and chalkboards at railway stations and, well, apart from the British Rail that announced it over the Tannoy, you know, British Rail Police, and, uh, you know, that all ranks three power need to return to barracks immediately. You know, that's that's how we were getting in touch with people, mate. It's, you know, there was... I know. What do you mean, that, what do you mean Telegram? How how does that work? Well, Telegram, you know, you see on these old films where, right, I've got a Post Telegram. Card. Yeah, but, yeah, not far off. Yeah, it's, it's like a, a letter that's sort of posted. It's a, it's a bit like, remember the old E. Bluey? It's like yeah, the yeah. early version of an e bluey, you know, where you know somebody types it and it turns out as a message and then it gets delivered, you know, to to wherever you live in. I mean, ours all went to our houses, you know, it's got Kandahar written on it. Kandahar was the you know the barracks we were in, which is also the you know the word that sort of was supposed to spark you into action to get back because you know break all records getting back to camp. But uh, yeah, that but that's how we got in touch. I mean. Funny story, really, but you know, on that on that Friday, we got to we all been stood down for that Friday. They said, right, you know, blokes can go home. Uh, I mean, didn't survive contact with anything because before most blokes had got home, they cancelled it and said, oh no, it's properly kicking off. Yeah, I'm definitely going. You know, you need to get back to camp. So we seen these chalkboards and um, uh, oh, what happened? He's on side. Uh, right, someone phoned me. Like I oh, said, okay. I <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, so, so we saw these chalkboards. I thought, and like everyone else who was there, went, sod that. I'm going to get one more night out of this before we do anything. Like, you know, so went home. <laughs> Next thing you know, I mean, it's proper, it's proper gone mad like this by this point. Yeah, because, you know, they were, they were now in camp. They were trying to find everybody. A lot of people had reported back. Some people hadn't gone home. You know, there was, there was like people missing from each of the companies. There's blokes in jail and all sorts when it all came out. But, you know, when we trying to trying to track everyone down. But I was dragged out of a nightclub at two o'clock in the morning by a very angry, like, copper at the time who said he'd been looking for me for hours. You know, like, you needed to get back. And he chucked me on a train at Wellingborough and uh, sent me back to, to camp. And there we were in London, sort of waiting on the station, ready to go back to Tidworth. And, uh, and very slowly, this little gang got bigger and bigger and bigger. It was all the blokes who had done the same as I had and all gone on the lash for one last time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and we all got back into Tidworth at about sort of nine, ten o'clock that morning. So it was good, yeah. But, but that's how we got called back. You know, it's, uh, you know, that in the background, I mean, I know now that uh, that they started requisitioning um, ships and boats and things. You know, the, the Canberra was a, a cruise liner. They used uh, the Merchant Navy, didn't they? Yeah, Merchant Navy was there. Merchant Navy's doing a lot of the uh, refueling, restocking, and all the, all the supplies, you know, that sort of stuff. But things like that, you know, the Canberra, I think the Elk was one of the carriers. Uh, <laughs> The Norlin Ferry, you know, which was later used for two para and for our return. You know, all these ships in the background, you know, the wheels were turning. Then this week where, you know, the Argentinians attacked, and the, oh, I think it was the second or third, second, um, uh, you know, in that week, big wheels had been turning. There's a lot of work going on in the background. You know, the, you know, the Canberra's captain had been told that his ship had been requisitioned. It was getting refitted, you know. All this and, you know, for us to go on there and then travel down as this task force that Margaret Thatcher had sort of put together. That was good. Yeah. Mental. Me yeah. How, how, how long did the, uh, how long did the, the trip take on the ship? Uh, weeks. I mean, you know, I mean, we went, um, we, we went down initially to Sierra Leone. Um, so we went via Sierra Leone to, you know, and at that point, you know, the first bit, it was, you know, the weather was, you know, not that good. You know, we were, we'd kicked into this, you know, massive um, training program. Everyone, you know, the CO was quite adamant we were going, you know, to, you know, get some training done while we were there. We were doing shooting off the back of the, you know, fun shooting as opposed to anything else, because obviously you're bouncing around on a ship. Quite interestingly, you know, to the untrained eye, you know, I was watching the mortars lay the mortar on the back of the ship and then knowing a bit later on when it was a load of rubbish, but it looked good, you know, because they, they couldn't, <laughs> couldn't really level the bubbles up as on a ship bouncing across <laughs> on, the, on the Atlantic Ocean. Right, you know? but, but it's all good training. And because um, you, you've got to remember, you know, what we've, what we've got now, what we, we've had in the last, I don't know, what, 10, 15 years or so, you know, there was no pre-deployment training. 
So we were as good as we were ready to go. You know, when we when we went on that ship, and there was the, the faster bang time was was quite quick. There was uh, there was there was not an awful lot of time to think about it, and and we sort of went with what we've got. And it was only later on that all things like you know the um, Arctic clothing and things like that caught up with us. Uh, and I'd forgotten that, you know, until I read the commander's diary, uh, and just sort of see how 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 that that chain you know followed us. And like I said, we went down to Sierra Leone. We stayed there for a little while. Interestingly, one of the guys, and I don't know the exact relationship, but one of the guys was, uh, was, had a relative who was quite high up in the, uh, <laughs> in the Sierra Leone, um, uh, what do they call it, monarchy, sort of what they call it. And, uh, and he wasn't allowed to get off to go and, to and visit the family. I won't mention his name, but it's, uh, <laughs> we'll have a chat you know, later on about it. But, uh, but he wasn't allowed to get off. They thought it was a little bit too dangerous. But we were sort of anchored off Sierra Leone. We went in there a bit later on to refuel, but yeah, you know, we, we were anchored about three miles off, you know, and they, they were refuel they were restocking us and everything else. Um I can't remember how long we stayed there, if I'm honest. Um yeah, you know, we, we were not wasting time, but we were I think they were waiting for other ships because the camera was quite quick. So as a as a as a sailing ship, as a as a cruise ship. So it, it took a it took a fair while for some of the support ships to catch up and keep up with us. What was on this ship? I mean, I know you would you doing your training, you you doing as much fitness as you could in a limited in limited way on there. But yeah. in terms of um, preparation for the operation, what kind of int and briefs and things like that were you getting? How much how much did you guys know by the time you got to the uh, the what you call it landing area? Um. We knew a fair bit. I mean, at one point, you know, further on down the line, when we started on the second journey, because we went there, the next leg of the journey was down to the, the Ascension Islands. Uh, so we went off, you know, heading down there. We were getting sort of drip fed. We'd now got maps. We knew what was going on. Uh, we'd got people who lived down there, been on the previous deployments, knew sort of, you know, the areas around, you know, uh, Stanley, that sort of thing. So we, we'd had pretty good sort of ground briefs. We knew what the state of that was. There was uh, Royal Marines had been posted down there previously, who were now as part of the 442 commander that were on the camera with us, you know, could could give us that information, and they were preparing sort of briefs, yeah, you know, that we could use and pass on, or got passed down to me, you know, as a private soldier. So uh, it was a steady trickle. It was pretty slow because there was clearly no internet at that point, uh, and everything was, you know, we had to wait for maps to be printed, we had to make for hard copies of. You know, reports and things to come through and get you know transferred in the mail system transferred from one ship to another that you know that it was it was just very slow but it but it was a steady trickle and we you know we tried all sorts of things you know to sort of i don't know combat that you know make sure that we were prepared for for that but like i said at that time we had what we stood in we were in old dms boots which we weren't allowed to wear on the ship by the way because they were worried about it you know feasting all the carpets and things like that so we had to wear trainers on the ship, except when you were doing running around the deck, you know, which is which is bloody hard work. Because one minute you're going uphill, next thing you're going downhill, and everyone's like <laughs> ramming into each other around the deck, running, doing these like circuits, which is crazy. But um, what was what was your sorry? What was your position in the platoon? I, I was just a, a private soldier. I was uh, I was the rifleman uh, gunner, I think. Yeah, at one point, and then uh, yeah, I ended up as a rifleman. Yeah. Was the structure of platoons then similar to what it is now? I think it was from re recollecting with the books. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, as I recall, when I was in, it was, I mean, you had, you know, a section would have a, a jimpy gunner, yeah. like a, a, a light machine gun, a um, bunch of riflemen, and then your section commander to IC. Yeah. Was it well, a section level? Well, the only, yeah, but the only thing we didn't have was, you know, obviously we didn't have the, uh, what do you call it, LMG? Oh, the weapons yeah, systems are different, obviously. Yeah, yeah, weapons systems are different. So all we had was SA-80s. SMGs, which is, you know, very World War II. No, you had SLRs, not SA-80s. Yeah, no, no, SMG. So oh, we had, I thought we had, no, you said SA-80 just now. Oh, did I? Sorry. I, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I said, all right, so we had SLRs. We had SMGs, which was a short, little stubby thing that most of the signalers could carry, radio ops. Uh, and the GPMG. So that, that was it. That was the, the weapon system we had. We had the... Charlie G, the Carl Gustav, everybody's favourite, except when you've got to carry it, uh, which they had a few problems with, 66s, you know, amongst the sections. Uh, but but apart from that, you know, that, that was it. That's all we had. Mm. Um, 
so so talk about the lead into into the Falklands then on the boat on the ship. Well, I mean, as I said, you know, we were trying to train as best we could. You know, we were doing a bit of shooting, we we're doing that, and we were doing sort of like you know keeping keeping fit, you know, because we didn't know really what was come. But wherever we landed, unless you sort of landed right in sort of the face of Stanley, you know, there was a there was a hell of a lot of walking to be done. So trying to keep that fitness going on a on a ship for that sort of period of time um was was quite hard you know you know it was but it's very hard to fill guys times but we really started looking at things that we take for granted now you know as i said before things like pdt which covers a whole um range of sort of things that you're going to come in um touch with you know things you're going to do on an operation as, as they've learned through various sort of uh, operations over the years you know it's down to a fine art and it's a fine program and you know they've got um things like you know risk assessments and risk registers for people that haven't carried out that training so we were we got stuck into things like uh, you know the medical training you know i mean that was a that was a, a big one you know everybody sort of knew you know, and still does, you know, knows the, the importance of that medical training. Although, you know, years later, things have come on leaps and bounds. And we've learned probably the hard way through some pretty, you know, serious operations and serious casualties that, you know, uh, how to deal with that thing uh, really, really well. So it's something we do well for all the wrong reasons, unfortunately. Um, s- sorry, go on. I, so I was you... going to ask on that subject. So, um so, yeah, that subject of um, you know the knowledge of the value of medical training, and all that. I, my when I was when I was in and when and when um, not so much with Iraq, but certainly when Afghan kicked off, um, and we came back from that Herrick Four tour. What I saw, what we realised, probably maybe some of you is the question, really. Maybe it's some of you guys after the Falklands. Is that what I realised is that. There had been a, a period of time before Afghan where lip service had pretty much been paid to your bog standard training. You would do it. You go through the motions of your, you know, your your your, your war type training, your your war type tactics, your conventional warfare <laughs> tactics, um, your your medical training. You go through the motions, you would, and and you would do as much as would need to be done. When we came back from that uh, first Afghan tour. One of the things that we focus on within three power and, and other units, and then when I was involved, the other pre-deployment training for other units going to Afghan is trying to highlight to them this stuff is real. You need to eat and like take this stuff on board now. Your medical training, all that, you know, um, fire maneuver, staying in cover, not the commanders standing up like getting a map out between them all in a, in a hustle. But things like now, I know, is like critical. But before that, it was done with lip service. Back in the Falklands. So the point of that is back when the fault was you when you were going down there, what was the battle experience or contact experience, I should say, like within the battalion? And because back then Ireland was going on and that was very, very much more kinetic than it was when I well, it wasn't kinetic when I was there at all. So were was the battalion, was there a significant proportion of the battalion? They they'd been experienced contact, they experienced a two-way range. And therefore understood much better the, the importance of those basic basic foundation skills or not um i think i think you're right northern ireland was uh you know a little bit more kinetic than than in back in those sort of days that uh, you know the you know 60s 70s you know we've only just got out of the sort of the quite difficult time in ireland um and i i, I think quite quite a large majority of the battalion have been to northern ireland you know quite recently um and although you know probably not many of them had been in a contact situation it was a threat environment which so i think they were quite used to that you know for people like me and the other people that hadn't been in that uh, you know their knowledge and experience you know shone through i mean you know, going back a little bit when they were trying when they were trying to um you know sort out the orbit as who was going to go you know they um as always you know there are gaps in the battalions and they, they trawled you know they pull people off courses jungle warfare courses you know scbc psbc uh and and then and then when they were still you know unable to fill all the slots they pulled all the ncos out of depot so we we had you know eight pulled out of depot seven uh corporals and a sergeant you know all with really valuable experience of places like northern ireland in the past 
I do think the Falklands was a little bit of a, a one-off. I was I was look at, back at the Falklands and think that it was the, like the last fair fight we ever had, you know, because it wasn't a big IED sort of like central sort of place. And, you know, they, they did leave little booby traps here and there, but it was all basic stuff and hidden under helmets and crap like that. And, you know, the odd door here and there. But I do think it was the last fair fight we had. But the the amount of training value out of it in the years immediately after are exactly what you said. You know, the the training that took place was taken seriously because there were people there who could tell you exactly how it happened. And OK, it's not textbook. And, it, you know, I know over the years in the training courses that we've got in you know, juniors and seniors down in Brecon have changed, you know, relevant to some situation. We, we I think we went through a bit of a, a fob culture down there where you had to go in, you had to have a fob. But, you know, I think the test of time has seen, you know, normal, basic routine tactics work in any environment with a little bit of, you know, changes to procedures, living conditions, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure they do that now. I'm not, I don't think so anyway. Um, but like you, I, I remember, you know, I was in a, I, I joined the mortars by at the end of 1982 and I ended up as an MFC. One of my one of my company commanders I worked for, you know, he was the 2IC of a company in the Falklands. And uh, he was he was spot on. You know, he wouldn't do anything. Uh, there was no unless you told him there were going to be rounds on the ground, even though there were, you know, unless he knew they were there, he wouldn't move. You know, he'd hold you to it. If he was a little bit late, he missed HR, blah, blah, blah. He would wait you know, because he knew that he couldn't go without that. He wasn't going to risk his men. Yeah, yeah, they were going to die. Like you said, there was no section commanders standing around doing the shouting hands on the hips. You know, everyone up and running, follow me. It was on your belt buckle, crawling, hiding behind rocks, you know, doing all that and all doing things properly. And, and as you know, you know, over time, unfortunately, that that wanes a little bit. You know, that that sort of goes away. And uh, but that's because that, that's because sorry, that, that's because uh, you will definitely experience the same thing I experienced in terms of the ebb and flow of experience within a unit, be it three power, two power, one power, be it any other infantry unit or any, any unit, it doesn't have to be infantry. Yeah. There's an ebb and flow of the sort of mean average of experience among the commanders in the unit. And, yeah. and, and it sort of directly ties in with the, the, do you need to go somewhere? No, no, go. Oh, you're looking like you're I'm, I'm trying to get comfortable in my chair. <laughs> I'm not going to be talking that long, mate. Right. Um, and, it, and that ebb and flow of experience ties in with the ebb and flow of ops. You know, as ops peak, there's yeah. a peak in experience, and then and as ops kinetic ops drop off, like yeah. Falklands finish, and then there's a period of time after. I mean, it's probably, I mean, probably with a, with a few years after, you probably saw a, like a bigger, um, a bigger departure of NCOs and, and and just people in general after that from the from three power than you did before. It probably spiked a little bit, like a, like with us. And so as you get people leave, because they, they go, I've done that, I've done what I'm doing now, I've proved myself, blah, 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 whatever, yeah. then all that experience goes. And all of a sudden, the people taking those lessons, teaching those lessons, the people that are in command of the platoons and the companies and the battalions become more and more people who haven't had the kinetic experience. And so yeah. they don't know. So it's one thing that they don't, they don't like have an emotional investment in what they're teaching or doing really because they haven't been there and been shot at whatever and so it's harder for them to convey the message because they haven't got the it's not their fault you know but that that's i think that's what you're talking about that that ebb and flow of experience and yeah. knowledge yeah. and unfortunately it gets lost and it's happening now it's happening now in across the hm forces as we're not doing anything at the minute and i i'd, I'd probably yeah. speculate that after after the Falklands. well operations are our best recruiting tool mate aren't they i mean that's what gets people <laughs> in and you know Bloody fair dues to the young lads of today. You know, when I joined, first of all, I knew nothing about the army. Uh, but, you know, secondly, you know, there was nothing going on, really. You know, I didn't really know about Northern Ireland. I assumed I'd go there at some point. And, uh, but, you know, when, when it all kicked off, um, if, you, if you joined the army at a certain time, you know, and a certain units, you were guaranteed to go. So I've got, I've got a lot of respect for the young lads that joined during that time. You know, from 1999, you know, we were very busy. As a, as, a, as a regiment and an army, you know, as it went on and units started rotating in and out of, you know, Afghanistan, or Iraq first, then if Afghanistan, you know, uh, and these guys kept coming. They kept coming. You know, they, you know, you can call them the PlayStation Nation all you like, but this was this was reality and they were up for it. So, I, you know, I 
you know, I appreciate you know that. I, I look was, back at them now. It, it was it was it was tw- it's been it was twenty years of craziness from that ninety nine to yeah. to to just last year yeah. really. I mean, it's just Afghan Iraq, but. You, you said Sierra Leone, Bosnia, Kosovo, all those places. But yeah. you said something really interesting. I want to go back to the Falklands. Um, you said something really interesting earlier, and it was, you think that the Falklands are a last fair fight. And I hadn't thought about it before. And you're absolutely right. i absolutely right. I've, I've spoken about, um, like, fighting with people from the Middle East, different, completely different culture, don't speak your language. Just everything is completely different about them. Yeah. And I've referenced it before to Ireland. How hard must have been to operate in Northern Ireland? Because you are, you, your enemy are people who are exactly like you. They're your culture, pretty yeah. much, you know, compared to England, Wales, Ireland, pretty as close as you can get, right? Your yeah. culture, they speak your language. They know what makes you tick. They know what yeah. buttons they can push because they know you inside out because they are like you, you know? Yeah. And, it, and it's pretty much the same for Argentina. They didn't speak the same language, although some of them probably did. But man, they they you know, they might as well be at the time a first world country. If not, they weren't far off. Yeah. You know, they they're, they're a developed country. It's it, I mean, I have never experienced that, and I would imagine fighting against someone who has got that knowledge, that like developed country knowledge, who's got a better understanding of who I am as a person, as their oppo. Yeah. It's it's frightening to be honest. It would be a challenge, mate. So where did so coming back on track? Where where did the ship? Where did you? Where did the ship go when you got near near at the Falklands? Uh, well, the ship. Go, we went down to the Ascension Islands after that. Yeah. Um, you know, th- yeah, there was all sorts of things going on on the way down. You know, they were trying to organise a sports day with the with the Royal Marines to try and keep us all busy. You know, amazing like things like table tennis and a ten ten thousand meter race and a. Deck coits or something like that. You know, it's a, you know, lots of interesting sort of things to keep the troops am- amused. But um, it was, you know, from then we, we sailed down to um, to the Ascension Islands where we were going to go and stay. You know, and uh, uh, the Ascension Islands still, you know, a long way out. You know, nothing there, big volcanic bloody island. But, you know, this was a, a time to sort of get off, shake out, you know, get the boats on, on some dry land for a little while. I think we went on, on uh, ashore for three days. Yeah, we would. You know, the anti tanks were out. You know, doing they had the big wombats out there doing doing a bit of live firing, firing the mortars, all that sort of stuff. You know, to uh, to to do that final bit of training really, because I think I think at that time there were still people going around saying, hey, you know, we'll be turning back soon. It'll all be sorted out, and uh, <laughs> yeah, there'll be you know, old Maggie will not come to her senses, but you know, she'll do a deal with them, and we won't. Yeah, you know, we 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 won't be going much further. You know, so. Although we were taking training very seriously and getting stuck into it, and, you know, I think in the back of our minds, as we were lying around the swimming pool doing a bit of sunbathing in the afternoon, because the weather had improved at the first part of it, you know, after up to up and around Sierra Leone, it, it was all right. Of course, once you know, the Ascension Islands, boiling hot, out we went. You know, we were practicing beach landings. We were out on the ranges. We were tabbing across, you know, from one side of the island to another because it's not that big. I think it's about thirty mile by ten or something like that. Um, but yeah, you know, it, we, we were all pretty pretty lighthearted about the whole thing. But you know, as as we'd sort of been there for about a week, I think it all started getting all of it. There's more in coming in. You know, we're finding out more information, you know, about what's going on down there, and you know, there's there's more information sort of coming in. We're just finding out that there's bloody hell, what seven to eight thousand like soldiers in. You know, Argentinians in and around Stanley were like, oh, right, you know, that is like 500 of us. We're going to sort them out. That'll be, that'll be great. Um, but, you know, so all that's trickling in. You know, we're getting that sort of information in now. Um, and, and we're we're busy. So sort of, we're practicing beach landings. We're on these LSUs, these big, I don't know, you can sort of landing, landing craft things, you know, uh, out the back of the, sh- you know, off the side of the ship, you know, it's bloody dangerous, dangerous business getting off the side of the camera onto a ship in the, in the swell of the ocean, like to travel to into the shore to, you know, practice a beach landing. And, you know, once you get the thumbs up from the old Royal Marine specialist, we can then uh, whip our kit off and get our shorts on and like sit on the beach and, you know, paddle in the sea for a bit. You know, it's, uh, it was all a bit surreal, really. Is that funny? Yeah, it was. It was good. It was. It was. Oh, I'm just trying to think. Um, I've got some things here, you know. You know, and we, we left. I've got. I've got a note here. We, we left um, 
the Ascension Islands now in May. Now, you know, now bear in mind, what's that? That's, uh, that's nearly a month now. We've been at sea a month now, you know, uh, and then we start, start, start heading off to the Falklands. So this is the last leg. Now it's got getting got really serious. You know, we've got, you know, darkened ship procedures where we're blacking out all the things. You're not allowed to have the lights on after four o'clock. You know, you, everyone sort of, can, there's like a, like a curfew almost. The two can rules gone. We're not drinking anymore. You know, we're taking this pretty serious. It's because uh, up till that point, it was all like you know, you can you can drink if you want to, sort of thing. And there's a two can rule, which obviously obviously doesn't work all the time. And there's a few cases, <laughs> there's a few cases in the commander's diary of where where it didn't quite work. But you know, it's uh, and, th- and that's when the the Arctic kit finally caught up with us. We've been at sea a month, so we we're now sort of going through this, and it was in. It was some Thatcham, which is where I don't know where it's now, but that used to be the old stores, the old um, defence stores where yeah you know, we got all these Arctic you know kit you know the um, windproof stuff with the SAS war you know that uh, and that was the first time we saw any of it you know as we were setting sail from the Ascension down down to the Falklands because at the time that was the Falklands sort of autumn time right May June yes yeah it's supposed to be yeah it's supposed to be it's supposed to be not bad weather apparently I think you know it's uh, but it was it was Falcons yeah. always horrible, mate. Always yeah, I know. Horrible. Yeah, I was trying to be nice to it. I was trying to be kind to it. But you know, it's quite. Yeah, we start we start heading off, and we're we're, we're zigzagging as the as the diary says down towards the Ascension Islands, and uh, you know, you think, hang on, we're hard targeting down. Then they start telling you things that there's you know there might be submarines in the area and all that sort of thing. You're like, what? You're like, okay, now, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, there's there's a. Yeah, I I remember it. I, I read it a few days ago. And, you know, there was a, a thing in there about how you know they they said that the Argentinians have got these like mini subs, and that we need to be aware that you know these frogmen, these Argentinian frogmen, might be like snuggling up by the by the side of our boat, like you know, our ship. Like, All right. Anyway, so you know, part of the drill was when you were out uh, there on lookout, you know, you had to look <laughs> over the side to see if you could spot a frogman. Uh, it was not, and you think, nah, fucking serious. <laughs> Honest. But that's what we. And that's what we were doing. This is 1980, 1982. And we're like looking for frogmen in the sea, like waiting to attach limpet mines to the bottom of our bloody boat or our ship. But uh, yeah, it's a, it was a bit of a crazy time, actually. You know, it's, uh, it, was, it, it was unbelievable. But off we, yeah, we still, off we went. You know, we'd all got this new kit now. We're all feeling pretty confident. And uh, somewhere along the line, I can't remember where it was, somebody worked out that, you know, the, the Canberra had a nickname. It was called the Big White Whale. We was like, all right, okay. But then we hit a whale, right? And uh, we used to have these, yeah, we, we ran into a whale, a, a dozy whale, like got hit by the Canberra, no, yeah, straight in the side, you know, and hurt it. And apparently that's that's quite bad luck. And, uh, and uh, my claim to fame really about yeah, that bad is... Yeah, bad luck for the whale. Bad luck for the whale, <laughs> yeah. But I was on watch. We used to have a watch. We used to have so this massive set of bino- binos, like, you know. On the side of the ship, and I happened, I happened to be on watch when we hit that. And he, I mean, he, he was a fair old beast, mate. You know, it rocked the boat, you know, and then the old trail of blood. Was Did he really? It. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you felt it was like a proper shadow down the thing, and of course, everyone's was like, oh, well, that's not good news. And then when somebody started looking into it, um, they worked out that the ship had been given the BFPO number six six six. Obviously, the devil, you know, anything. Nah. Well, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it was like, well, who the bloody hell made that up? And of course, this then, uh, yeah, conversation sort of followed later on that, you know, this is this is not good that we've now got three battalions basically plus loads of attachments, you know, there's always forty four two on us, you know, on the on this boat, and they thought bloody hell, you know, this could be getting, you know, this goes down you know, if the big white whale goes down, and you know, with its with its dodgy BFPO number and clobbering a whale in the sea, you know, it could look look pretty bad. Uh, so uh, quite shortly after, and, and as we were getting caught quite close to uh, to the Falklands, you know, they they split us all up and sort of started, you know, identifying you know which ships we would go on to. So uh, three power went on to the Intrepid, you know, which uh, is one of the navy ships, and we and we transferred onto the Intrepid for a, a very short period of time. I think it was you know twenty four hours, if, if maybe a little bit more, but not much more than twenty four hours before you know they started the landings onto the beaches. So. Uh, and, and, yeah, I, th- I think you know, you know that was around the time, you know, that the um, the special forces SAS helicopter went down as well, got lost. A, apparently, a bird went into one of the intakes on one of the helicopters. So that was it wasn't a good time, Pebble, you know. Pebble Island, right? 
Yeah, I think, well, Pebble Island and all that was around the same sort of time. But there was there were SAS patrols and that flying around uh, at various times. I think they were doing something on Fanning Head as well and places, other different... They were, they were involved in other sort of things, moving around. And as they were bouncing from one ship or ship to shore, whatever they were doing, uh, you know, unfortunately, one of the helicopters went down and, uh, uh, and you know, those brutal sort of seas down there, it, uh, you know, a lot of them, you know, died, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm. It, uh, it was it wasn't a good period of time. I mean, yeah, you've ever you ever done that that helicopter dunker thing down at Yeovilton? You see, oh, that's all right. Cause the water's warm, and you're wearing a set of coveralls and a helmet, and it's all not too bad. And you can, you know, but you know, North Sea in all your kit, holding, you know, wearing your webbing, yeah, you know, hanging onto your hanging onto your weapon. It's uh, not the same thing. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was a bit of a sad time, really. That so uh, that we because we got told about that, and uh, and it obviously came over the tannoy on the on the on the ship. So. It was, um, yeah, a bit of a, it was a bit of an eye-opener. Uh, and, of course, by this point, you know, the Belgrano had been sunk. The, um, I'm trying to think what the ship was called. Um, there was a supply ship, got hit by an Exocet, didn't it? I'm trying to think what it's called. I'll think about it in a minute. But, uh, I always remember it out of one of the, Falcon, uh, one of the Pink Floyd songs. Oh, God. Yeah, anyway. I can't remember what it's called. Oh. But, you know, it was... Uh, it was, yeah, it wasn't the elk. Uh, I'll think about it in a minute. But, uh, but yeah, by that point, yeah, we'd started to take some casualties, you know. There, was, uh, there were people dying. So it was, uh, it, yeah, it was, it was just a game. Bloody hell, you know, we're not going to turn around. We're not going to do a U-turn here. We're going to turn around. We're, 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 this, is, this is bloody serious, you know. And we, we transferred into the Intrepid. We're, you know, it was, it was mad. You imagine, a, you know, nearly the whole battalion has now got onto this, this like, uh, this Navy vessel, we're all grabbing a, a place where we can. There's people lying in corridors. I, mean, I remember, you know, going down these steps and there's these Navy lads in there, you know, and they were like, oh, yeah, you know, sharing their, they got a fridge and the beer and they're sharing it all with us. And they thought, oh, we're thinking, oh, you know. They're a weird they're, lot, aren't they? They're a weird bunch, yeah. The Navy are a weird lot, mate. I've got to be careful, mate. My, son, my stepson's a submariner, so. Uh, wow. Know, yeah. Oh, they even weirder. <laughs> Even weirder. Um, yeah. Which, uh, which? So, tell me about the landing. Oh yeah, well, you know, we were. Like I said we we were hanging around. I don't think we were there more than a day, you know, um, two days at, at the most on on the Intrepid. Uh, got settled in, you know, all fed. That must have been a nightmare. Uh, and then we got the non. Yeah, we were going to go. You know, early that morning. Yeah, the next morning we were going to all, you know, get onto these things, all given orders. You know, we had to have guides out, give them, give them cars, landing sort of like cards, so you you knew exactly what what vessel you were going on, what short you're on, etc. Uh, and then we were in, the, you know, again, like I said, it's all getting pretty serious, you know. And uh, we're down in this sort of bit, and you know, they'd already these these navy lads had already give us this brief. It's quite funny because he says, right, he says, because there, there was a guy talking over on the channel, and he's saying. You know, and there's a big these these numbers all stenciled on our wall, and uh, and they were talking about Exocet missiles because obviously the the uh, the uh, supply ship had been hit by this Exocet. They were saying, like, you know, if you hear missile bearing, and he says them numbers there, he goes, there's an Exocet coming through that wall, and we're like, yeah, right. And he's like, no, no, honest, yeah, that's what happens. And he says, yeah, what you have to do is you have to run up the ladder. He says you have to close that hatch. We're like, yeah, from the other side. He's like, no, no, no. So, you know, you've got to do it as quick as you can and, you know, sacrifice yourself. We're like, mate, you're, we're in the wrong job here. Uh, get me off this. Get me off this <laughs> ship. So, anyway, so, so we got all started getting ready. You know, we're there. We've got like, ammunition draped across us. We've got, we're putting cam cream on and everything else. And they thought it was amazing. But, you know, I mean, everybody did their bit. You know, the Navy did their bit when we were down there. You know, they were, they would do things that we thought, God, bloody hell, you know, that's like, you know, they were manning like the guns and, you know, watching the air and doing the air raid warnings and all that sort of stuff, you know, in some pretty naff kit by the look of it. I'm not sure it's got any better in the Navy, but, you know, it looked pretty, you know, pretty old and a bit, bit like our uniforms, really. It was only 1980. It wasn't that long after World War Two, was it? So uh, I'm just I'm just looking for this. Oh, Atlantic Conveyor. Atlantic Conveyor, mate. Yeah, right. Yeah. You're right. I was just Googling yeah. it there. Sorry. That's why I yeah, wasn't looking it. At was. It was. It was. It, it was it by, uh, it, it, it was it by the exit. And of course, that, yeah, that opened our eyes. So off we went. You know, the next morning, we're all loading up, getting onto these um, <coughs> LCUs, I think that's what they're called. LCU, LSUs, an LCVP, which I don't know what's standard, landing craft, something or other, uh, you know, to take us in. 
So the, the LSUs were the big ones. Uh, the LC, LCP, VP were the smaller ones. And that's, and that's relevant, really, because when we got in, you know, I think we've all seen Saving Private Ryan. You know, the BBC really messed up at some point because, uh, you know, they, they made an announcement that two battalions of the Parachute Regiment were about to conduct a beach assault onto the Falkland Islands. You know, they, they put that over the net, you know, and it was like, oh, you know. You can imagine the old boys in the war. You know, this, like I said, this wasn't that long after World War Two, And these, like, Normandy veterans are thinking, Jesus Christ, this is going to be horrendous. You know, these, you know, they sort of remember that from, from their time sort of fighting in, you know, in the, in the war up until 45. And, uh, but amazingly, you know, luckily for us, when we got in, you know, there was no enemy on the beach. They'd started to retreat. They'd all pulled was back. It, did you land on the West Falkland? Uh, we, 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 we were in, yeah, West Falklands on, in, we landed near Port San Carlos. That's right, San Carlos. Yeah, yeah, yeah Port yeah. San Carlos. Yeah, we were, there was San Carlos and Port San Carlos. So we were, we were in Green Beach, Two Para, Blue Beach, Obviously, it took them ages to work that out. That would have taken the old e even. The, I reckon even the Argentinian intelligence would have worked that one out. You know, it would have would have took them ages. Eh? Um, but when we got to the beach, this is you know, we we were on one of the bigger ones, and uh, and all of a sudden, before you know, it, you know, we'd hit the deck, and there's like this guy, this navy guy in charge of it. He's like that's a big dipstick basically, over the side. He's like it's twelve foot. We're like we ain't getting off, mate. Yeah, you know, we can't. And bear in mind that we weren't being fired at at this point, you know, because you know, we would have lost them. So the, the other ones, the smaller ones, went in and had to come back and we had to cross deck to then go in so that we wouldn't go. You know, I mean, this, this water was like 12 foot deep. Who was point. on the smaller ones? Uh, other other members of the battalion, you know. So, oh, just, yeah. just you happened to be on the LSU? Yeah, I mean, they basically split split everybody down in between the different craft. So I think, you know, A Company, we were on with some of the bigger ones. B Company were on some of the smaller ones. And we were going in. And like I said, as we, as we got closer, we got stuck. The smaller ones went in, landed, and then they chugged them back, got, got to us, tied them to the side of us. We crossed decks, and then we went as well. Yeah, but, mate, you've got to get off that water. Do you remember Prick? Who? Prick? Oh, Not yeah, Bob, yeah, yeah, era. yeah. Do you know the story of Prig? I think it was Gibraltar. No, what has he done? So... He, he, they were doing, as I recall, they were doing some beach landing, and they and it was like got the thumbs up, yeah, you're good to go. Prig jumps out. Now I'm butchering this story, but Prig jumps out, and it was 10, 12 feet deep, but with all the kit on. Mate, he drowned. Yeah. He drowned. Did? He got revived oh, at the that. beach. Yeah, yeah. As, well, again, I'm butchering the story. My recollection <laughs> goes, Prig jumped in, it was like 12 foot deep. You don't swim with all that kit on, and he fucking uh, drowned, mate. Yeah. 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 Well, you see, like, again, going back to that Saving Private Ryan film, you see him start walking up the sea, walking out the sea and sort of coming out. Well, that's great, but 12 foot underwater is a long way in, isn't it? You know, it's <laughs> like, and, it, and it's bloody freezing. But, you know, you, off that story that you just said there, I mean, one of, one of the Royal Marines, when we were transferring onto the boats, you know, he fell in the sea. I mean, it pulled him out, saved him, you know. Oh, my God. But when he was trying to cross deck and get out, you know, and get onto, I can't remember whether he was trying to, it was the bit where we were going to the assault or whether he was getting off the camera and going out to one of the boats that, that, we, that we were being allocated. He fell in the sea. I mean, that, it was bloody dangerous. It's like, you know, this, this, the sea was rocking about. With, you know, I'm pretty sure it was on the, on the camera when we, they just opened this door in the side of the ship that you wouldn't even imagine was there. And then, you know, you had to wait till the ship come up and step across and like wearing your burger and everything else. He went deep, straight down the gap, you know, and into the water. Like, you know, so you're bloody lucky to be alive. So it, um, yeah, so, so that's it. So we, we, we went in, there was no enemy there. Um, a bit later on, when we went into um, Port San Carlos, you know, got talking to the locals and we, we they, they told, you know, people, the, the commanders that were there that, you know, that they, they'd gone. And, and around that time, again, this is sort of the bit where it all starts getting a little bit serious because we'd already heard the SASs. We were going in, the, the you know, the, the decoy really was the SAS all kicking off on our left. There was lots of, you know, was, you know ammunition, you know, tracer flying around all over the place. Um and the enemy had done a runner. Yeah, you know, the Argentines had done a runner. What what time did you land? Uh, I can't remember, mate. Uh, early day, or, in the day or night? Uh, early in the morning. Very early in the morning. D dark hours. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, I think it was dark when we were going in. It was. Short, I think it was just getting light as we were as we were coming in. And uh, but they gone. There was a few helicopters flying around. There's a Sea King, a couple of the gazelles. One of the gazelles got shot down, uh, and it and it went into the water. And the, and, the, and these these Argentinians that were 
you know, um, around and the ones are probably the ones that shot it down, shot the pilot and the co-pilot in the why they were in the water when they'd already downed them. You know, one of them, you know, unfortunately died. Yeah, you know, a bit later on, the other one, you know, was, you know, yeah, you know, obviously suffering from gunshot wounds and and hypothermia at that point. Uh, and then a bit later on, you know, there was another one um, where uh, uh, one, another gazelle was shot down a bit later on. You know, when we established ourselves in Port Can San Carlos, you know, another gazelle, you know, going around. Uh, and when they got there, the pilot and observer, you know, dead. You know, so it, it was it was all pretty serious at that point. But, you know, real good eye opener stuff, you know, reality checks for, for an awful lot of people. You know, this was it. We were on the island now. Uh, uh, and it and it was all getting real. It had been getting real for for quite a bit of time, and there was there was no turning back now. You know, despite the fact that they were retreating, you know, these small numbers that were there, um, and you and you don't know who was there. I mean, I you know I don't know what type of the enemy was because they had an awful lot of conscripts. You see, they had uh, keep, keep talking. I mean, yeah. two seconds. Okay. So you know, and uh, I said I said earlier on about the. Um, yeah, the Atlantic conveyor. I've got a note here that the Atlantic conveyor were, was hit uh, a bit later on. It, uh, but we'd also had you know, quite a serious blue on blue at that point. We'd had, um, you know, we had patrols out. There was re various reports. You know, it's all very difficult. Communications is hard. You know, there was um, there were reports of sort of Argentinian patrols in certain areas and it, it, it all got a little bit messy because, you know, C Company saw some people in the sites, you know, they started firing at them. Turns out it was an A Company patrol. You know, and we ended up with sort of um, members of the battalion sort of, you know, getting hurt, you know, getting, you know, getting, getting really shot up, you know, within a couple of days of being being there. You know, we were oh, going out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's in all the box. It's not it's not something that, uh, you know, that, that's, that's ever been hidden. But it was... You know, early doors, you know, it was one of those, it was like, oh, bloody hell, you know. And But it just goes to show how how poor things like our night viewing devices were, our communications were, um, because people didn't know where they were, you know. And one of, the, one of the big sort of things around the whole thing is that the patrol that was going out um, was, was basically reporting that they were in a position and they were a K out at least you know, of where they thought they were because they were just operating off a map and a compass. There was no GPS. You know, there was, there was none of that sort of stuff. <laughs> no, one, uh, one of the issues with, uh, as I recall, so I went to Falklands 20 years later in 2002 as Roman Infantry Company. And then we, they did, I mean, it's the first time Paradise had gone back there on a posting, not a posting, but like a, a task since Falklands. It was obviously deliberate for the commemorations and all that. But I remember, I remember thinking at the time, like, it's not easy terrain. It's not easy terrain yeah. to navigate at, if it's at night. It's not well, in the daytime. It's not that easy. At night, it's not because it's there's not many features. No. The it, I mean, unless you're around the the you know the unless you're on a spe specific areas where there are big features like uh, tum Mount Tumbledown, you know, um, and and Longdon and places like that. There isn't. There's there's lots of sort of slightly undulating terrain, but it's there's no features, difficult. is it? There's no features there to for, orientate. For my, Every now and um, again, you want that that feel good orientation. Yeah, that's definitely for that. my for micro for micro navigation. It is not easy. Not yeah. easy. You know? Yeah, you know, no, that's just I me agree. making excuses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when did what year did you go down the Falklands? Two thousand and two. Twenty years later. All right. Okay. Well, I went down in two thousand with uh, two para. Because two power laid up their colours, you know that was the first time I went back, uh, okay. and then I went back again in 2012. You know, because again three power were going down in 2012, uh, and I was the regimental adjutant, and I just an A company three power with the the Firic, you know, uh, the company that was going down there. So I managed to get myself a week down there. It was brilliant, absolutely fantastic. You know, really, really good. I had a good time. It was. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed good. it when I was there. Well, some yeah. parts of it. I was getting. I was a Tom. I was like. <laughs> I've been in two years as a time, mate, getting beasted. But uh, no, there were some good times. I managed. I mean, there's the three pubs in the Falkland Islands, and I managed to get myself barred from two of them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, going back, going back. Um, That's a good effort. <laughs> I know it was a good effort, mate. It was a good effort. Got it. Uh, yeah. San, yeah, San Carlos. What? So, 
What happened after that? Um, after the landing? Well, straight after that, I mean, we stayed there for quite a little bit of time. You know, we, we dug in. Yeah, we're digging trenches. I mean, it was just so wet. It was just, you couldn't, I mean, you ended up, you know, a bit later on, you know, we hadn't learned the lesson at that point because really, you know, we'd only been there a couple of days. You know, we were told to dig in around Port San Carlos. We're out doing patrols, you know, we're sent on various things where, you know, we'd, it had been reported that various groups of Argentinians had, you know, were out patrolling and coming down, you know, reports of sort of 50 man groups of people sort of wandering around. And yeah, we were get we were sent down on various things to keep us, keep, keep us, uh, keep us going. Um, but it was, it was bogging wet. I mean, yeah, every time you dug a hole, it filled with water. It was just bloody, there's no way you could keep drying, you know. And at that point, you know, we started eating rations. It was all getting a little bit bloody samey. But uh, so, and then, of course, we got the nod to that we were going to start the advance. You know, we knew that two para were going to go and do something at Darwin, Goose Green, that we'd had the nod at that point. You know, the it was getting sort of fed through that they were going to go up and say that because they'd been in touch with a couple of civvies down there. The... Um, Couple of a couple of civvies that escaped. There's a guy called I think Terry Peck, who, who was sort of well known in some of the um, the books, uh, and a couple of others who who were passing information. And they were basically telling them where where the information was, and they thought there was a you know a big old crowd at, at Goose Green. So two para were tasked with that. Was Peck the copper? I think you might be right. Yeah. Yeah, the copper. Terry Do Peck, you know what? Yeah. I, when I went at O2, we went we because just before just before the O2. Um, tour, if you like, an in inverted commas wasn't really a tour, but tour that uh, th- there the a few months before they had been found off the coast uh, on the West Island coast, you know, the the, uh, the, the coast, um, a, an Argentinian SF rigid rigid raider type thing. All right, yeah, yeah, and so one of our tasks was to we we would patrol on foot the. the I made it 80 Ks one time, hey, like epic, like the old hoop, hoop bivy bags. And so I was, I was a 320. No, was I a 320 man? Yeah, I was on the 320 around, around the West Falklands. But during those things, we, if we came across a farmhouse, we'd go and try and stop in and go, can we sleep here? Not sleep with you, sleep in the farmhouse, you know, in the, in the barn or whatever. And there was people on the, in some of those farmhouses who were there during the Falcons. Yeah. And they yeah. would tell the stories of when the soldiers were there. mate, it was unbelievably us. And some of those some of those farmers, I remember one I won't name the farm or because it was uh, quite a, a famous a well known farm. But the dude was super, super cut up about yeah. about his involvement with it because he, he had I mean they're British, right? But in helping the British um against he'd help the British with his far his tractors and stuff like that. And he was, even 20 years later, he was cut up in tears because in helping the British reclaim the Falklands for, you know, and rightly so, yeah. it had resulted in Argentinian deaths. And the guilt he felt, mate, right, was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, yeah, you can't knock the Falkland Islanders. You know, and, and even now, you know yourself, you know, you go down there, they are such a nice bunch of people. And, uh, but at the end of the day, somebody invaded their land. You know, somebody invaded it. You know, and... Uh, yeah, maybe you say, going back to what you said about those patrols, you know, I've heard, you know, guys talk about their, their trips down there doing the Firic and saying that, you know, th- th- although there's lots of patrol reports out saying where people have been, some of the farmers down there said, bloody hell, we haven't seen soldiers down here for years. But when Reg go down there, you know, they, they go for it, don't they? They yeah, we're gonna see, we say we're going to walk there and go and see these farmers. We're going to go. And they're like knocking on the doors going, bloody hell, we haven't seen soldiers around here for a long time. <laughs> and, and getting the same reception that, that you got there and the same stories. And you know, of course, these people are all grown up now, got kids of their own. And, you know, some of these were, you know, you see the old pictures of these little kids. You know, when I back it went back in 2000, that was like, you know, 18 years after. You know, there were people there. We had a big reception. They were like, oh, yeah, you know, I knew that. This is where I was. This, I, I remember this. And they were sort of similar age you know, to me, some of them, and obviously a lot younger, you know, at, at the time, it was it was absolutely fantastic talking to them. But, you know, going back to sort of Terry Peck and the and the others, you know, they provided, you mentioned Int and what Int we were getting. Yeah, you know, there's nothing like somebody who's been there, somebody who's lived there, somebody who's seen it, you know, but they were reporting, uh, you know, on various things. So we were we were down to go to Teal Inlet, the three-para, which was 30 k's away. That's where we were going to go and march to. 
Uh, and he said there was no enemy there. He said they, yeah, they, they, there might be small pockets, but but nothing, nothing big. Um, and obviously there was the, there were um, civvies, you know, Falkland Islanders in in Darwin and Goose Green who were reporting back, you know, on a radio, you know, to you know, so that they could sort of pass information about what was what was there. So that that was really good. Um, so we left we left Port San Carlos. <clears throat> we got a. Uh, we got a lift. Well, they had these rigid raiders. You talk about rigid raiders. The, the Royal Marines had these bloody rigid raiders and these guys, you know, who turned up and they were going to take us across. Basically, to stop us having to walk all the way around this inlet, they were going to cut us across and save us loads of time, which is great. So we all jumped on these rigid raiders as like sections and like, you know. And then as we were pulling up you know, at the other side, it was like, bloody hell, this is brilliant. As we pulled up to stop to get out the bloody thing, it bloody sank, right? Because he'd stopped so quickly, right? The front, the <laughs> nose went down, right? This this Royal Marines now, who's now got this immersion suit on anyway, he's now up to his neck in this suit, going, "Sorry, lads, sorry, lads, you know this doesn't normally happen." This blah blah, we're like, "You fuck it, go going nuts on this boat." Because the whole idea of the whole thing was that we wouldn't get wet, we wouldn't, yeah, get across. So we spent another half an hour on the other side, wringing on, wringing our socks out and emptying the water out of our boots. It was bloody outrageous. <laughs> so, so he was a popular boat. But we just set off, you know, and it was a, it was like the biggest battalion snake you've ever seen in your life. It was a couple of days walk, you know, that we did. We were sort of marching for an hour, resting for 10 minutes. And all you'd just see right from the start, it was all like, it was like a big, like domino sort of thing where you, you could see that far, Eddie. And we were snuggling in around the, you know, in around the, the hills and going, just keeping in the low ground as you do and all that sort of stuff. And then you'd see a bloke right at the front sort of start to sit down and this big trickle came all the way up. But you couldn't afford to sort of sit down too too early because otherwise there'd be a massive gap between you and the next bloke. Like, you know, so you had to wait till your turn to fall over was like, you know, but yeah, but, but it was it was horrendous, mate. I mean, the kit we were carrying, it's just I mean, we were light scales at that point. You know, the Royal Marines had decided that we're going to go with Bergens. And I, I think they regretted that later. I think they went down to, uh, you know, light scales later. I think they lost a few people. Yeah, because because they, they made that decision to carry all their kit with them. Whereas but we if, hadn't. If you so you were you were going light scale. So what are you doing? Carrying what forty eight hours max food? Yeah, 20, I mean, or yeah. just twenty four? Twenty four normally. Yeah, but I mean twenty four push room. Twenty four yeah. push room emergency. How are you getting resupplied then? Uh, well, when we get like places like that was enough to get us to places like Teal Inlet, and then we'd meet up with the CQMS. CQMS would then you know dish it all out. And, yeah, that's how. It but was. how is he getting there? Uh, oh, he's he's got like now we've got all these tractors and things like that from the civvies. They, they've you know requisitioned them. You know these these guys are you know, tractor drivers are like, helping us out, moving water rations, ammunition, everything. Well, not that we were short of water at that point. It was uh, there was plenty of that about, but there was uh yeah they, they were they were helping move ammunition, mortar lines, you know mortar ammunition etc. All up to you know the next place. We were also, you know, we, we had the helicopters doing underslung loads, dropping that in as well off, off the ships, off the supply ships. And from, you know, now at the at the sort of um, wherever the echelon was now located, which I couldn't tell you where it was you know, at this point. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we were getting resupplied. It, it wasn't a problem. You know, we, we were getting it on a regular basis. But you were carrying everything you had. And, you know, we had the old 58 web in. As soon as it got wet and it got wet day one, never dried out, you know, uh, you, know, you had everything wrapped in a poncho. You know, you had your waterproofs in there. You had a, a Chinese fighting suit, which was the only warm kit you had. You know, everything else, you know, I, I, and everything was damp. There was nothing dry. You know, you got bloody socks under your armpits trying to dry them out and all that sort of stuff. And But you had a pair of boots that weren't waterproof anyway. You went, and you're wearing putties, which they wore in 1944, I think, still. You know, it's just, just unbelievable. You know, there was no... There was no good kit like that. There was no good boots, and, and although there were other boots on the market, you know, you know, we hadn't been issued them. You know, it was only uh, sorry. No, you say, go on. Oh no, I'm just going to say that you know some of the guys bought boots themselves, high leg boots, because people used to buy Northern Nine Patrol boots, and then these are the new boats. You know, remember the first ever issue of you know high leg boots we got. You know, they were on trial, I think, at the time. I think it was about that time, but we didn't get them. But some of the guys in the platoon, I remember one guy, he, he'd actually gone and bought some. They were, they were right, a hell of a lot better than the ones we had. And, uh, you know, and, and offered some form of water resistance and, you know, water going in over the top. Whereas the ones we had 
you know, didn't at all. So uh, it, it was bloody hard going. It was it was it was hard to, hard work. Um, what was the RG air presence like at the time? Uh, it, yeah, good point. You know, I mean, they they did have a fair amount of aircraft knock them out. They had some helicopters and a lot of UEs and you know, but their but their main air attack sort of aircraft was a Picara. You know, Picara is a really really old, you know, really slow. You know, so. It stood, no, it stood no chance against ours, and I, and I think by that point, you know, we'd had a we had a few sort of of them, you know, taken out on the on the route. I think our, uh, you know, the air superiority really, as they probably term it, was uh, was well in our favour. So, you know, although we were suffering from air raids, you know, you know, the old air raid warning red would come along, everyone would dive. Not like there was anywhere to hide, you know, just like we're all just everyone just like dive and hope you didn't pick him you know didn't didn't pick you but you know every now and again you get one flying over you know they were they were bombing the um the ships in the inlet so as the you know the uganda which was uh you know the hospital ship laid off you know a long quite a long way but things like the you know the other ships that were coming in you know they, they were getting regularly uh bombed in 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 the ports in the inlets you know uh so the old navy again were were getting it and you know in by the aircraft there because they were they were sitting ducks easy targets you know they couldn't they couldn't move quickly they couldn't get out of the way and there's, there's nowhere to hide is there so where were you moving towards now uh, we were going to a place called teal inlet which where we got oh there. sorry yeah. yeah yeah so we were going there and there was there was no enemy three guys surrendered when we got there three three argentinians you know armed forces can't remember what they were but they had no weapons they were starving they were freezing cold you know and offered very little in the way of sort of hints, they'd been sort of sent down there. Now, you've got to remember, some of these were like um, conscripts. You know, they weren't regular soldiers. Yeah, and they, they did have some bloody good guys, you know. They had some, you know, some SF guys who were very good, very efficient, very very professional. But they had an awful lot of others, you know, to make the numbers up who weren't. Uh, and without the without the right leaders there, they, they weren't going to produce the goods or give out the information, you know, that they were, they, they really needed or were sent there to provide. So, so they became our, our first um our first pr- prisoners really um and then from there once we got into teal inlet that was now you know we we deployed up into the mountains i think mount estancia or oh sorry so from there i'll go back a little bit when we when we were in teal inlet we got we got told all about you know the two para and their attack onto darwin goose green <laughs> you know of course you know we, we were then hearing about their casualties and what had happened and obviously you know, CO2 para, you know, died, you know, during that period as well. So, you know, another massive sort of bloody hell. There's, a, there's still a fight here. There's people, you know, they're willing to put up a fight for this. You know, so it, uh, that, that was another uh, eye-opener. Um, and we were... We so were just, just, sort of, just quickly, sorry, for people oh, sorry, who listen, listen or watching, just give a quick yeah. outline of, the, of what, what happened to Goose Green. I mean, just an outline. Oh, Goose Green. I mean, Goose Green was. I mean, I've been there a couple of times now, and it. Uh, you know, the, the idea was that you know, two power was sort of given a warning. You know, that to to go down there. You know, there was there was a lot of civvies being held in the uh, in the um, in the building there, the community centres, and then they were sort of being held sort of hostage, if you like. Um, and two power had to do an assault on it, and I think it took you know a little bit longer than they expected. It was all very open. You know, some really sort of well-positioned sort of you know, sites that were sort of pinning them down, you know, and I think the assault stalled at some point and, you know, they were, they were trying to sort of push forward. It's all getting a bit difficult. CO pushed a little bit too far forward, you know, depending on whose account you read, you know, but he was in a position where he was actually, you know, right on the front line trying to direct, you know, you know that particular part of the fight and, uh, and unfortunately fell, fall, uh, fell foul, you know, and, and died, you know, got, got killed in, in the battle. Two power then went on, you know, with the two IC under control, under, under command, you know, or in control, you know, and and took took the fight forward, and and eventually, you know, two power after a, a bloody long hard battle, you know, and quite a lot of casualties, you know, died. Uh, sorry, well, went through just, and, and it, took the place. Yeah, it, I, I I'm trying to remember if I, if I went there in 2002 to Goose Green, or if I, I'm sure I went there. Or if I've yeah. seen photos of it, but it is just open. It's like, I mean. Yeah. You can liken it to uh, imagine playing a, a, a you know, a, doing an attack against the enemy. You've already dug in. They got the weapon systems there, and yeah. you, and they're at the at one end of a football pitch, and you're at the other end, and you've got to advance towards the enemy. Shoot! Yeah. They're dug yeah, in, yeah. and you're in completely open ground. Yeah, that's uh, that's how I remember it. It's like a, just 
places that you don't want to attack a lot. It is. Yeah, yeah. There's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's lots of gorse bushes and things like that, which are great for cover, but not fire, you know, that sort of thing. You know? and, and, yeah, they by by sheer aggression and, you know, the will to survive, I think, you know, they, they pushed forward and, and were successful, did a fantastic job, you know, really, really good, you know. And so, uh, so that was that. So we were getting the news about that. And at the same time, we got sort of tasked, we were going to go to um, Estancia House, which is our next sort of port of call. That's our next, that's our next thing. I can't remember how far that is. But that was another, you know, again, big, massive battalion snake, you know, in the low ground, you know, air raid warning red, Fukara's coming over, getting buzzed by them. And, you know, you know were, they engaging, were they engaging you? Oh, yeah, yeah. They were engaging us. I mean, bloody hell. I mean, there was blokes like firing Malam missiles at them and all sorts. It was like, we were, you know, they were firing us. They were like, I think we were, <laughs> We were sort of caught in the overflight of where are they going? They're probably sort of, oh, there they are. I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I assume you mean, that they're you, also. You mean, uh, did you have Milan then? Uh, nah, they did have Milan then, did you? You're on about, are you yeah. not on about one bat? No, no, Milan. We had Milan then. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, because we had, we got some additional firing posts a bit later on. Because mm. what they got, what's, what's, the, what's the one they got now? What's the, what's uh, the javelin. Tank? Javelin. Right, with Milan was the initial one before that. You know, it was there for a long time. Yeah, we had it ages. But but those guys like trying to fire at the aircraft with these missiles, blokes going nuts. Like, what are you doing? You know, like, these things cost thousands of pounds. Like you know, you know, trying to take oh, out an aircraft. The the it's like the. Do you remember the air defence drill for a rifleman? I don't know. Well, it might be different then. But when I was taught it, uh, when we were going before the Iraq War, it's uh, it's it's. So you get you get the signal for an air raid coming, whatever that signal was going to be. You lie on your back with your rifle and you point your rifle at forty five degrees into the air. <laughs> you put it on automatic. And you just um, empty the, empty the magazine. <laughs> just just spray. You know, like just spray anywhere in the air. When you hit one of these, it's <laughs> just ridiculous. Mate, what, they mate, what, what, what else are you going to do with a rifle against a, a plane? Mate, they weren't teaching that on Junior Breton when I did it. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, mind you, they had larch poles and all sorts when I was there, you know, like GPMG on a stick. It was like, yeah. But yeah, you know, we, we, off we went again, you know, like I said, there was guys sort of, you know, yeah, we were reacting, to, we, we'd we obviously been walking for quite a few days now. We weren't at Teal Inlet very long. Um, and then we pushed on. Yeah, it was, it was bloody cold. You know, we, we, we'd had a night in one of the buildings there. I remember it well. You know, it was, it was our only sort of saving grace. And then we were back out in the elements again. It, uh, and we went to Mount, uh, Estancia House. And then from there, we sort of deployed into into the hills around the area. And Estancia House was designated as one of these places where we would offer a, like, a bit of a respite, you know, with a bit of um, R&R, for want of a better word. And the, the chefs were going to cook us, like, dinner and things like that. And it was probably the worst meal we had the whole time we were there, like, you know, because we've been on Arctic rations, which are quite generous, you know, um, when, you, when you're on rations. They're quite, they're quite good. Uh, there was plenty. There's plenty there to eat, uh, and, and of course we had to go down and eat this bloody horrendous meal, like cooked by the chefs. And you put in was like two bald sweets sort of thing. Like yeah, cheers for that. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> do you know how far I've just walked? <laughs> but then we were we were like up in the hills, and uh, and quite quickly. I mean that was end of May. You know by yeah two days later we were receiving sort of orders to go uh, and attack Mount Longdon. Yeah, that was, you know, this was the, the now the 2nd, 3rd of May, something like that. Yeah, we were we were you were down to go and attack Mount London. Bear in mind that the actual attack didn't go until the 11th and 12th, right? Uh, and that is because, you know, as we sort of started to move off. What's up? Well, uh, I thought, well, I'm getting confused. I'm I thought it was June, 11th, 12th of June. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. So, yeah. But, so the first bit was May. So it, we're in 2nd, 3rd of June, sorry. All right. We got right. the order to go and, and attack yeah, Mount Longdon. Okay. Like, bloody hell. <laughs> but then it turns out, then we got the uh, the brigade commander, like, stopped. So, so you see, I would give all these orders. We were going off. We were off to go and attack Mount Longdon. There'd been wreckage taking place and all this sort of stuff. We'd done, you know, the naval gunfire, you know, adjustment onto, um, onto you know, Mount Longdon and all, and all that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we were ready to go. Brigade <laughs> commander comes up as we were setting off. Yeah, stop. Don't go any further. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit worried. I, th I think he was. A, I think I think the term he used was he's worried we were getting into something we couldn't, you know, sustain or get, you know, get out of. 
you know, rumour control at it that nobody else could keep up. We were actually pushed ourselves so far forward that the logistic chain couldn't keep up. So oh. if we then push that further ahead so quickly, you know, then it, it wouldn't have happened. So unfortunately, you know, my, my view is we lost a bit of momentum there, you know, where you know, we didn't carry on the fight as, as soon and gave them time to recoup. You know, obviously, obviously just been spanked at, at Gooch Green by two para. You know, where I'm thinking, oh, hang on, here they come. Let's bolster the defences, that sort of thing, in exactly the same way we would, you know, if uh, if that was the case. But um, yeah, from there, yeah, we were allowed to patrol. We were allowed to send patrols out, but but we had to basically stand still, you know, for uh, six six or seven days. You know, at that point, we were there for a week. Why? While I think I think the logistic chain had to carry up uh, to catch well, up. Uh, uh, Estancia. We were at uh, Estancia now. Okay, Estancia yeah. House. Yeah, so we were in the hills around Estancia House. Uh, we, like I said, we started to move off. Then we were stopped. But uh, I mean, I, I went on the, uh, you know, on the on the recce when they were at naval gunfire. Was doing the adjustment. It was just amazing, really unreal situation where we we walked our way up. We had to cross the this river. I think it's the Moral River, and it was bloody freezing. And of course, then you're on the other side. You're on top of this high feature. And there's the old naval gunfire teams who are like adjusting the guns off the boats onto onto the positions, and they're like you got like cold water running down your leg, and you've got the sergeant major walking down going, "Come on, boys, keep warm." You know, like, fuck you know, it's bloody. It was absolutely. Good. And then we knew that we on the way back, we had to get back in the river again, so it wasn't wasn't, wasn't particularly fun. Who was the sergeant major? Uh, oh God, you asked me a question. The, the guy I remember is a what, what did you expect? I can't remember. I can't remember saying. <laughs> I think it was in a minute, but um, there was a, there was a sergeant major attached to it, a bloke called Doherty. I'm not sure his name was Sammy Doherty. What a guy! I never met him before. You know, he was another one of those that turned up from from somewhere. But he was like a little little guy, just went around, just talking all the time, just trying to keep morale up, trying to keep people going, and thinking bloody hell, you know. And he's like, I think, well, if he can do it, I can, you know, that sort of thing. I'm, as I'm pissed wet through, knackered, and still got to get back in the river on the way back. You know, it was uh, brilliant. But um, but then. When we actually went, you know, a few days later, um, you know, by this time, you know, the patrols had had a uh, had a run in with the with the Argentinians. They'd been out doing some checks. Patrol, patrols platoon. Our patrols platoon, yeah. At that time, you know, they were down doing some checks of the Murrell Bridge. You know, the bridge. When I say bridge, it was a couple of planks of wood over the bloody river. Um, just, just before yeah. you go on, sorry. Explain for people listening and watching what the patrols platoon is. Uh, well, in those days, it was just a, it was just a, a, patro- a, a platoon of you know, specialist guys who, whose task was to, you know, go ahead of the main body. You know, in, in more modern terms, you know, we've got the pathfinders who work in, in you know, collaboration with our patrols platoons within within the two battalions or you know, three battalions as it was. Um, and they would their task is to go forward, recce positions, provide guides. For the companies, each each of the four man patrols uh, can operate independently or as a group or as a platoon if need be. But their primary task really is to guide the main body of the companies uh, and assist the the sergeant major, CO, platoon commanders to get them in position. You know, for things like start lines and you know, you know, for the ready for get ready for assaults. Essentially, uh, um, pathfinder task within the battalion right yeah it is it was it was a pathfinder capability and then you know i, I remember our patrols too before the pathfinders existed so you know it was uh pathfinders all quite a new thing you know uh, a bit later on but uh, you know they'd had a run-in with the argentinians you know they had uh, they were down there they were doing some some checks around there doing some final sort of checks about the river and the size of it and everything else and you know uh, and they got attacked. They got they they they, they were in a in a bum fight there, and had to bug out and leave their bergens and a radio there. You know, oh my god! Yeah, yeah. So that was, uh, you know, that was that was quite a sort of a low point. Yeah, you know, because obviously we thought at that point that our communications had been compromised and everything else. So, but uh, excuse me, I don't think it did that much that much harm. You know, the, um, I don't I don't think the Argentinian intelligence were were good enough to do, you know, anything about it. You know, so uh, and, and that stuff turned up in the Argentina. If you go to Argentina, apparently they've got that in a museum there. So, which is only what we do to them. So it's uh, <laughs> to, to be to be fair, we have got their weapon system sitting outside our our regimental headquarters and our battalion, you know, our battalion offices. So uh, they're only doing what we do. Um, 
But, you know, I mean, they were identifying, you know, 81 uh, and 120 mortar positions, uh, command locations. Snipers were deployed at that point. They were going forward with them, you know, and taking out some, you know, commanders on uh, on, on Mount Longdon at that point. You know, there's a couple of well-known sort of snipers, if you read the books, you know, out, out there, you know, doing the business and doing what, doing what snipers do. You know, you know, you know better than I do, you know, that, that sort of thing. But, yeah, it was all going on back then and all great opportunities for... Uh, you know, people who have trained for so long, trained so hard to get that qualification, get that skill, you know, to actually go and put it into practice and come back and, you know, you know, you know report on that and report back and make sure the people are in the best position, you know, the best information that they've got and is possible uh, to go ahead and, and, and do the task, you know, which is which is all you can ask for. What was a company's role going to be with um, with the Longdon attack? Um well, A Company, A Company was the the lead company when we when we finally left. I think we left on the we left on the eleventh. Um, so we like I said, we'd been there six seven days by that point. So how far? 11th, sorry, how how far away from Longdon were you at the time? I can't remember. Uh, if was a, it was no. a better than fifteen twenty k's. If that okay, yeah, it wasn't that far. Um, but, uh, but because of the river sort of uh, situation, I mentioned like, going in the river, they decided, the engineers, right, decided they were going to make these, like, bridges. And when I say bridge, that's quite, you know, I'm giving her a little bit of poetic license here because it, it was a ladder with a plank strap to it, right? And that's what the engineers came up with. <laughs> so, so I was one of the guys in A Company that had to carry this, this bridge to, to the to the. To the and then we had to sort of lay, there was a number of them, I can't remember how many there were, but, you know, we, there was four of us carrying this ladder. And uh, when we got there, we had to then drop it over. How big was the ladder? Four of you carrying it? Yeah, yeah. But I was bloody, well, it had a big, massive plank strapped to it. And everything oh, else yeah. Was bloody heavy. And you're still wearing all your kit. You know, you're carrying everything you've got. <clears throat> so we're like, in, within the patrol, you know, off we went, you know, up towards the Murray River. And, uh, and we had to drop the plank over the river. And then get across. So we were quite lucky. We were right because it was pretty steady and it was dry and everything else. Bloody hell. By the time everyone else, you think it was like a P Company event getting across there, like with these, it was like treating it like the Trinasium. It was like, you know, the, as I heard, there was obviously a couple falling in and things like that. And it was just like comedy. It was, but, but it served the purpose that we weren't actually soaked to the skin before we even got, you know, too far across. The fact that, you know, ground was quite wet anyway and, uh, you know, you were still sort of falling in knees up to your knees in your holes, you know, everywhere you went. It was either there, but I think they were just trying to protect the blokes as much as they can at that point. But uh, so we were the lead company up to that point. And then when we got up onto the position, the idea was you've seen sort of pictures of the Falklands. And just to explain it, you know, I've been there. The, the, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, if you've been back to the back of Mount Longdon and you're looking up the feature, I'm trying to explain it for anyone who's not is there are basically slabs of rock all at an angle that create sort of alleyways either side of that rock. And if you're in one of those, you know, you can't get out. There's no way out. You can't climb over and go into the next one. You're committed to going up that. So as, as you're looking up that sort of part of the feature, that's where B Company were. B Company were the ones who were going to go and assault up that. And if you're looking directly at that, if, if, if that angle of assault is sort of 12 o'clock, we, A Company and C Company, were round to the left-hand side with uh, A Company, who were supposed to do like a simultaneous uh, assault. So as they went up the feature, we were supposed to come in from sort of left to right uh, and sort of, you know, close in on the on the flank, the left flank of, of London. Um, so, sorry, where was B Company then? Well, B was Company it? would... Yeah, no, no, B Company were the ones who were going to go up the feature. We were oh, around the sorry. left A Company. C Company were behind us, and you know, and uh, C Company were, were the reserve company. But the thing is, a bit later on, when it all kicked off, you know, uh, and it was supposed to be a silent attack, but it went noisy because um, there was a corporal in, uh, in B Company who stepped on a mine, you know, a brook called uh, Brian, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, lost his leg because of it. And, and that turned it into a noisy attack. You know, it went from, you know, from that point on, you know, they brought the artillery file down down onto the DS so that they uh, uh, recorded. You know, and, and it all kicked off. That's when it all went, you know, you know, you know mad, went noisy. Um, and so I'll come back to you know Brian in the minefield in a little while. But as we were around the left hand side, you know, B Company went up. They were doing the assaults up there, and like I said, 
once they got into these avenues, they were committed. And, you know, the Argentinians have been there for a long time. They've built some pretty big sangers out of the out of the rocks up there. They had lots and lots of ammunition, some big old weapon systems, 50 cows. They were firing down down these down these arcs. B Company were, you know, they were getting getting smashed and you know, smashed to bits. Um, and A Company, which I was with, you know, we were we were still uh, uh, advancing. And then it got all very difficult when, you know, if you're looking at this massive feature that's still quite some distance away, but hard to tell because it's dark still. Um, you can't see where B Company start and the Argentinian start. And at points, it's all crossed over because once they're in these alley, they're, they're basically going past some of the enemy and some of the enemy were then firing in from the back of them because they were in a different part of the, you know, the feature. You know, it was all very, very confusing, very difficult. Uh, you know, and a tough fight. You know, they were they were really up against it when they when they went up there. An A company then got told, you know, because we we'd been spotted by this point, so some of the fire off the feature was now being directed to us. And of course, C company who were behind us, anything that wasn't getting us, if it wasn't landing short, it was going behind us. Of course, B, uh, C company were now we were in reserve, and now taking casualties behind us because they're waiting to come up, you know, and and do whatever they whatever they can do. So we ended up sort of hiding in this peat bank while we sort of decided what was going on. One of our guys got shot in the head up looking over the top of the peat bank, you know, classic out of the film stuff. Or, you know, one of the guys, you know, took a direct hit and died, you know, almost instantly. Uh, and again, you know, bloody hell. And at that how, point... How far away from the feature are you now? Um, I think having been back there, probably somewhere between four and 600 metres. Jesus so, Christ. Yeah. That's a lot because I'd say that I, the reason I said that I, I, I've been yeah. there. I went and did uh, H. Harrison. It was B Company, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was B Company. Tom. He took when I was there. No, two. He was there, and yeah. he took us through a, like a. He took literally walked us through where he was on that on that hill, yeah. on that mountain, I should say. And yeah. uh, mate, four to six hundred meters away from that feature, they got yeah. all the advantage of of the height. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it was just very protection. difficult to find out where you like, – like we talked earlier on about navigation, you you know. It's very difficult to know how far you are away from things. And we were, we, we basically gone round. I mean, it might have been slightly less, but it didn't bloody seem like it, you know, if I'm honest. <laughs> uh, and we're, it, uh, so at some point, you know, the CO said, right, stop there. Don't go any further. You know, Tim Jenkins you know, got killed, unfortunately, uh, and we had to leave him there. Um, and then we were told to, right, get up, you know, turn right. Uh, follow, go up round the back of B Company, come up behind B Company, and uh, and and take over from them, you know. So so we set off, off we went, you know. We were leading, you know. Next thing you know, the old lead guy comes up. He goes, oh, "Hang on, sir," because we didn't know about you know um, the minefield at this point. But then, quick, very quickly, we realised that we were in it, you know. So the whole company was now marching through this minefield. And it was like, "Stop! What's that?" Oh, yeah. Caught Mills down here, sir. He's just, he's in a, we're in a minefield. He's lost his leg, you know. And a bit later on, you know, it was, they, they worked out that they, they think that what saved a lot of people, because we had no choice, we just had to carry on. Um, and uh, they think that what, what saved a lot of people was the fact that, because it was really cold and icy, that the uh, the water had maybe frozen, you know, the mines and that they, it hadn't sort of detonated them. So that, you know, probably, don't know how true it is, but it, it sounds, sounds like a good war story, doesn't it? But, um, <laughs> but but yeah, we were we were in a minefield, and there was no there was no markings, there was nothing there. And later on, you know, a couple of the guys came in to pick you know um, Court Mill up, uh, and uh, one of them lost his foot, jumped out of the vehicle, landed on a mine, blew his foot off. You know, so it was all you know. And two other guys that were around him, right, got shrapnel off it. You know, so it was it was all pretty serious at that point. But we had no choice but to carry on, and then get up behind B Company. And then just off, you know, off the um, off the flank of them, around the around the side, just stay below the the, the level and 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 prepare to take over them. So, so B Company now, uh, I uh, on on Longdon, you had the uh, it's nicknamed the football pitch. I just remember, I just realised he used it. It was term, rugby. It was pitch. rugby terms. Yeah, it was. Ah, uh, rugby field. Yeah, it was rugby. Uh, as in, four it was back, a, right <clears throat> half, all the different so, positions on it. To, to explain to people listening or watching, it's like the Falcons are just like a, 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 a. It's basically a mountain of rocky outcrop. Like, yeah. wor, like the. I think the only feature worse than that to attack. Uh, or worse than that, to like even just walk up, like yeah. in like normal times, was tumble down. Uh, but with with uh, Longdon, it had this one. 
they had this one flank of it where it was like a clear it was like a clear approach all the way up the side to yeah. near enough the summit and it was just like it's like a corridor of like almost flat ground sort of it wasn't just yeah. rocky outcrop i wouldn't say rocky outcrops but well, you know i wouldn't say yeah. rocky outcrops for people listening and watching we're talking six ten twelve twenty feet massive rocks just like like something yeah. out of flipping the most rocky place you've ever been but it had this rugby pitch football pitch orientated slight uphill really flat area towards the summit which was like yeah. the but which was completely covered by RG fire you yeah. know it, 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 but I think that was B Company's approach, was it not? Yeah, well, B Company had gone up through the rocks there. I mean, they'd had a fight before they got that point, you see. So they had they had to clear all those big rocks that you're talking about, those big, massive features to before they got to that bit. Uh, and that's where, you know, they were getting beaten back. They were losing comms with people in, you know, because there was no you know, man-to-man comms at that point. Yeah, there was... Uh, very command and control was very difficult. People, like I said, were getting in front of each other. You know, there was there was all sorts going on. People getting pinned down. There were some pretty, you know, hardcore sort of like fighters up there at this point. You know, they were fighting for their lives. You know, and uh, you know they they'd been there a long time. They'd established their positions. They had loads and loads of ammunition. Like I said, they had big fifty cows on the top of the hill, which we later turned on them. And uh, you know, they by the time they you know, gone up there, they'd come back, they'd regroup, they were now trying to get their casualties back, you know, get them out of the way, regroup, find out what they've got, find out who'd been injured, get their all back sorted out, get some new commanders in there. There we have two sergeants there grabbing guys, getting making makeshift platoons out of whoever they had left, because there were there were an awful lot of injuries uh, at that time. Uh, and they went again. You know, you know, they tried another, you know, another another attack. Um but the, but there was no chance for them. You know, they 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 would they were just getting beaten back every time. So that was the, that was just sort of the point when A Company were ordered to sort of go uh, go through them. Time wise, yeah. how long into the from H O it happening? How long into the battle were we? Here? Well, if I remember rightly, I mean I think we crossed the start line at about one o'clock in the morning. H O one. Yeah, and I think. That was something like seven or eight o'clock in the morning. Jesus Christ! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, yeah. mate, it was all night. It was that's what it, that's what it was. It was a, it was a, it was a, the night of nights. You know, it was a, it was a long old battle. So that you know, by the time that point, you know, sort of half seven, eight o'clock in the morning. You know, everything takes so much longer. Everything takes oh, so much yeah. longer when you can't see jack yeah. shit, and you can't see. Yeah, and you you know thought about it. Yeah, you know, I, I obviously did thirty six years in the end. I saw a lot of lot of things come in. You know, if you had bloody little helicopters, you could chuck over the top and have a quick Scooby over the top and see what's going on. It, it could have saved a lot of trouble. But um, but you but you couldn't. You had what you got. Uh, so yeah, I mean we were sort of warned off. You know, a hey, company you're going to go on that. I mean, I I never forget it. You know, we were down just below the fight. There's tracer flying around all over the place, just over the top of the hill. We've got our machine guns all set up, you know, um, you know, in fact, you know, you know, George, don't you? You know, George Duffis. George yeah. Duffis is one of the ones who set up the machine gun post at the top, you know, overlooking there, he was providing the old covering fire, you know, down, you know, he was, he was there with, with the two IC of A company, um, you know, getting all that, getting that all ready. And then they said to us, all right, all right, lads, get your webbing off, all right, have a brew. Because, I mean, it's like, it was like, honestly, it was like Christmas. It was like fireworks night. It was like everything was lit up. And having a, having a little bit of XE on the go, right, was not going to, was not going to put you in any danger. <laughs> yeah. So we were there, like, just having a brew, you think, you know. And uh, I think there were like jokes going around where the last time, the next time you're getting a bruise on the camera sort of thing or on the Uganda, which is the hospital shit, which is always good, always good banter, right, you know. But, uh, but yeah, we were like taking our webbing off. It was like, okay. Get your magazines and your grenades in your pockets. Get ready to go. Yeah, and we, you know, before long, we were like crawling through the gap at the top, on our bellies, right? With tracer flying all over the place, GPMGs firing over our, over our heads. You know, it was just, you know, like, fucking hell. You know, it was mad. I mean, at one point, I tell you, I, I just tell the story. It was like when I, when I went back in 2000, I went on my first time. I went back up to London. We were going around, and I was with the, the two IC. I, I, his name, Adrian Freer, who was later General Freer, you know, and you know, I said, oh, this is where we were, and I said, oh, yeah, I said, there was a machine gun up there, and he goes, oh, yeah, I was there, you know, and he said, that was me, I said, oh, yeah, were you, and 
I said, right, I'll tell you what. I said, we go up here. I said, there's a hole in the ground. I said, if there's a big square hole in the ground up here, I said, a you know, massive one. I said, this is definitely where we were. So we went up there. And although this hole had sort of been filled in, right, there was this massive hole that, like, loads of us were in it because it was the only, like, bit below ground at that point. And the reason I remember it was because when I went in it the first time, I, like, come out of it stinking as shit and covered in bog paper because it was their toilet. It was, like, oh. and it was like, but I thought, I'm safer in here than I am out there. And I thought, I can, <laughs> I can, I can put up with that. And I'm not, you know, I don't care. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, and then, and then we just started flying. So there was a section in front of us, you know, that, or a platoon in front of us, and uh, they, that was a section in front of us, and they went through, and they were fighting to the side. And then we were just, as... As they went one, we went one way, and we were all just clearing these trenches, going through. And most of them were gone. Most of them we were just checking the dead and like chucking grenades in there, and you know. But it, most, of it, most of it had all been done by that point. And at that point, you know, it was then you know this fight went on, <clears throat> fight went on for quite some time. And, and like you said, there's that big, massive, long feature, which now you remember where the um, the battalion memorial is in the top, because three power left a memorial there on the top. That bit there, that was all open. There was fire coming from the rocks down the far end, you know, and it was just fucking crazy, absolutely crazy. But, and then at some point, people are like, hey, they're, they're, they've turned around, they're running. They're all heading, they're legging it off the top of the hill and they've turned around and run off. So Where the are they thing, going then? Where could they go, though? There's they were to go, running, is there? Yeah, yeah, they were running to Stanley. That was the nearest, you know, Stanley was, uh, you could see from the far end of London, like you could see Port Stanley. Yeah. So, a, yeah. Yeah, and they were off. They turned on the reels. They'd had enough by that point, and uh, and off they went. So that was it. It was like, it was like real time. It was like bloody hell. And uh, you know, I got I got a quite a, a, a I got a uh, a thing here that was sort of um, written by you know David Collett, who's the uh, the C, the OC of A Company, and he, he said uh, the sight of gro you, groups of young soldiers, tired, grim faced, but clearly triumphant. Moving through the mist to check the enemy dead with bayonets fixed will remain forever vivid in memory. And you think, great words, you know, I think I never could have quite put it like that myself. And it, it's like, and that's exactly what it was like. That about summed it up. The mist was there. It was light. There was like this horrible, like, mist sort of going on. You know, and, you, and you've seen it in films now. And you think, oh, yeah, that's exactly what it was like. You know, but until I'd read the, the things I've read in the last sort of week or so, I'd, I'd sort of put that all behind me and forgotten all about it. And it was, it was just amazing. And like thinking back to, to what it was like, you think, wow. And then, of course, then you start thinking about all the casualties that have been taken. Now we're now, we're now collecting bodies. We're now, you know, getting all the prisoners of war together. We're now getting all the Argentinian dead and injured all thing. And, you know, and it, and it, it's that, that bit afterwards, you know, when, when people talk about the reorg, you know, for those listening, you know, it's just like, you know, the reorganisation at the end of a battle, it's chaos. You know, you don't know what you are, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know where all your blokes are, you don't know what casualty. There's people screaming out, asking you how much ammunition you've got, people asking who's dead, etc., etc. That's the time you get it all sorted out. But the reality of it, and you know this yourself, is carnage. It's absolute carnage. You know, because there's bodies all over the place. You know, we battered that mountain, that hill, you know, with artillery fire for days and days before. They were like dead Argentinians hiding, or hiding, dead under rocks, you know, because the big rocks had fell on them and crushed them and killed them and they couldn't get the bodies out and things like that. You know, it was just, you know, an unbelievable sight. And, it, you know, it was all that stuff that we found, you know, in during that real process, you know, real, you know, real, real stuff, you know. But, um... Yeah, I mean, that, that, that went well, you know, that very quickly, you know, two para, you know, got warned off that, about Wireless Ridge. And, of course, from where we were on, on uh, Mount Longdon, we could look across to Wireless Ridge. And uh, I know two para mortars uh, asked three para mortars to help them because they were doing this massive, um, uh, I don't know what they call it, um, area sort of... Um, uh, Harassing, harassing fire, harassing fire thing for around, yeah, because there's still sort of like groups of enemy in various sort of places, uh, and so they, so two power were going to concentrate really on the wireless ridge feature, and three power mortars were helping them sort of like fire at these other pockets of enemy, and like the MFCs were like this is like an MFC's dream. It was like we're on top of this massive hill, just looking over at this, you know, what can only be described as a big 
you know, group of playing fields all stuck together with small groups of enemy all running towards Stanley, all getting artillery, all getting mortar and artillery rounds fired at them. Like, you know, it was like a playground. It was just unbelievable. I don't, I don't mean that badly, but you know, you'll remember we were still fighting at this point, you know, and if, you know, it was all part of, you know, making sure that they weren't in a position because they were still near um, uh, Wireless Ridge. You know, they could have put fire down onto two para while they were going to go through the assault into Wireless Ridge. So they were still the enemy and still a danger. So. Uh, yeah, and, and and not only like what was going on with two and three para, you had four, four, 40 and four two commando over at the two, the two peaks or the two peaks or the two. Twin. Twin, Twin Peaks, Peaks Twin and, you Peaks, had, yeah. and you had the yeah. Scots getting ready for tumble down. That's right. It's like yeah. uh, it was still very much. I mean, your battle, had, your Longdon battle, had finished. Two yeah. parts are starting, but it was still very much. And you had them still occupying Stanley. It was. Uh, yeah, it was all smart. It was all you know, small parts in a big plan here. You know, as as many of these things are that, unless you're you know privy to that information, you don't really understand what your part is. And actually how important your part is in it. And everybody, all those different units had their part to play. You know, why we were doing that, Two Power were watching us and listening to what's going on. You know, we then sat on top of Longdon and watched Two Power go and attack the Wireless Ridge. Right? Go and smash them up on Wireless Ridge and, you know, go all the way across. And then, you know, not stop at the top, not stop at the end, you know, turn right and head down into Moody Brook. And, and Moody Brook was one of the uh, objectives that we were tasked yeah, you know, when we sort of secured ourselves on Longdon, you know, our next task was Moody Brook. So two power, we're going to take Wireless Ridge, but they but they just kept running. They, and two power just thought, you know, well, come down off the hill, chase them down, you know, and basically, you know, chase them off Wireless Ridge. They went straight through Moody Brook, so there was no battle there, you know. And before you know it, they're off. Two power are <laughs> now heading off into into uh, into Port Stanley, and with three power hot on their heels. You know, you know, trying to get in there too, and uh, yeah, I mean, it uh, all ground to a halt just outside by the race course. Yeah, and uh, everyone was told to sort of stop there, uh, and that I think that was when it all started with the, uh, the you know the surrender process basically started. You know, they had no fight in them. There wasn't going to be any house to house fighting in Stanley. You know, the fight had gone out of them. They'd been beaten in all these different places, like you said, all the you know the Marines locations, the guards, Earth, you know, two para. Yeah, it all come together all around these mountains that overlook and surround Stanley. Going back to Longdon in yeah. the, the reorg process and particularly where you're dealing with the prisoners, what 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 were what were they like in terms of how they were dealing with you? Were the with the prisoners on Longdon, were they cooperative, were they what what was I like dealing with that? I, I, again, and this goes back to the point where that's a developed country you're dealing with. These are people who are yeah. like you and me. They just speak a slightly different language. They're essentially a very similar culture. Yeah. I, I think they were scared. I mean, that was the, the, the look on all their faces. You know, they were scared. Um, we, I mentioned before about the, uh, the, the, the level of the soldier that you got there. There, there didn't seem to be that many commanders of, of any sort of great standing, a great, great experience. And from what we can gather so from reading some of the books, you know, a lot of those you know, left at some stage and, and disappeared back into Port Stanley to the safety of Port Stanley and left the fight to to some to the others on the hill. You know, having a determined enemy like, you know, us, you know, any any infantry, marine sort of infantry type base unit come up and assault you overnight and fight all night and, you know, putting you under pressure, you know, it is going to scare anybody. You know, and that's it. You know, brute, brute force and ignorance yeah, you know, sometimes you just got to get up there and get stuck in. Yeah, you know, you're fighting for your life at certain points and you're relaxing at other parts, but you just keep going. You know, you just keep fighting. And I think they were up against something that they just couldn't cope with. So I think, I think, I think by the time it was all over, I think there was a sense of relief. I think they were probably worried about what was going to happen to them. You know, but you know, obviously we, you know, we were guided by the Geneva Convention and we're going to stick to that. That was it. Was a fair fight, you know, as I said to you before. Um. So just getting them together, you know, identify their injuries. I mean, they had they had kit, but they didn't have really good kit. They had sleeping bags, they had mats, you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, they've been there a long time, but um, I, I think they were just pleased it was all over. If, I, if I'm honest, mate, I think once they realised that they were going to be get treated humanely, um, and that we were going to go through our processes again, it's something that we we talked about a lot. You know, how are you going to, you know take control of all these prisoners, how are you going to manage them, how are you going to log them, etc, etc. But 
you know, it's another one of those reorg things that putting it into practice is a whole new ball game to uh, to talking about it and drawing it on a paper and, and seeing a slide on it. It's a it, it's a massive massive undertaking, and there was a lot of them. You know, there was a, there was a fair amount. Although, like I said, the ones that could had all legged it down and were headed for Stanley. So uh, yeah, I I think relief is the is the is the term I would use. They were relieved. Did you, did you have an experience within? To your recollection, within uh, so during or before, well, during the battle, um, within uh, your platoon or your section of people who you have the 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 fight of the fight flight or freeze reaction to extreme extreme danger, extreme threat. And, yeah. and the reason I'm asking this is I, I experience, I've experienced it once in my career, not, not me. I've experienced it, and it was with three para, and it was I was on the, the, our second Afghan tour, and it, it was a, actually a, a really fucking really bad, um, a really bad uh, contact, super close with the enemy, super close to the enemy. Uh, it was like three flanks, and um, it was a bit of a nightmare. Uh, but I remember there was a guy, well, not one guy, there was a bunch of people, and they were all from the same little unit. And they weren't, they, they, the, the, the shock of what was going on, one of them it affected particularly badly, and the rest, it, it, they, they just weren't taking the fight. They weren't taking the fight, the enemy, trying to get the upper hand. They had the upper hand against us. It was an ambush, the ambush, was three flanks. Yeah. And it was like, super close, mate. And uh, but because they weren't taking a bat, they couldn't get up a hand. Now, the, one of those guys, so that one who was worst affected, was like super new, super new. He'd hardly been in battalion, you know, gone through all all the training, P company, everything else. They hardly been in battalion long. And, and and I think, to be honest, looking back, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of um, not scaremongering. People had a taste of what was to come with Afghan then. So they'd heard stories in the news. And so this guy had, had probably two or three years of, oh my God, Afghanistan, blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden he's out there and he gets this hide- involved in this hideous ambush. But that's not a nice, that happens, right? You can, in training for whatever unit, you can build people to try and get them can be conditioned to react in a certain way. There's always going to be people. And it's not that person's fault. It's just the way the human mind works, the way the, the brain's formed in certain people. That's the way it affected him. Did you did did you experience anything like that in the Falklands? Of that bang, contact happens. Holy fuck! And just sort of freeze. I can't do anything. Uh, no, no. I mean, we weren't in close combat like that. You know, in you know, in the same situation. I, I can see how you would end up in that situation with the ground. You know, out in Afghanistan. So, but in a in a in a slightly different sort of way. I mean, there were. A number of people that didn't make it to the end and to the fight for one reason or another that they miraculously sort of turned up at the end after all the fighting was going. So that, uh, that's as much as I'm going to say on that. Yeah, because, uh, but uh, you know, I, I think there was a lot of, you know, as, as I said, as it, as it started to develop, there was a lot of, um, you know, scary sort of stories coming back about what had happened. And of course, people have been killed by that point. And then the danger, the reality of it, was bloody hell, you know, this could this could be quite bad. This, so uh, I think I, I didn't see that. I didn't see what you saw firsthand, but I can I can totally understand what why you know why that would happen. I mean, as I said before, you know, showing something and talking through something and you know running along a plain field out in a field, you know, and talking through what you would do when this happens, you know, is totally different, you know, to what happens bang at that point and that split second that that. That point where you've got to make a decision, you know, it, it, and you, it, yeah, you know yourself, you know, best form of defence on an ambush, they fucking take it back to them, you know, because there's nowhere to hide. They've picked that ground. They've been there. They've been waiting for you. You know, there is nowhere to go. And if there is you know, in Afghanistan, you know, they put they put something in there, just, you know, that's going to blow up when you jump, when you jump in it. You know, so I, I could I can wholly see why why that happened and and why while I'm sort of in that sort of area. Uh, you know, when I was on the rear ops in, in on Herrick 13, I had guys come back who didn't want to go back. They didn't, they, they they wouldn't go back. They were scared. They were they were they were shit scared. And I can see why. You know, I could I can totally understand why. But uh, you know, it's another one of those crap well, things I had to deal with. 
Well, I think you know the same could be likened with if, if you uh, if you turned round to all your oppos who were there at Longdon or to Para with Goose Green, you know, and say, right, uh, we're going back in nine months' time. Yeah, you you see how you know you, 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 be some. It's not a it's not a nice yeah. thing to go back to. It's I think that's the only difference. Yeah. You know, I totally um, agree. You know, I've had loads of conversations with guys who've been on on the Herrick tours, and you know. You know, they've done it at various ranks and various jobs, but they've seen all the shit that goes with it. You know, it's, it's like I said to you before, I've got a lot of time for them because they went back and did it again and again and again. You know, if I, you know, we sort of touched on it sort of earlier about, you know, I said the, you know, the, the regiment had been busy since uh, 1999 with, I think it's Sierra Leone, Kosovo, all, all them sort of things. Um, when we finished the Falklands, we didn't go anywhere for nearly 20 years. Apart from Ireland. Yeah, a bit of Ireland, you know. But the first time I went to Ireland, I was a corporal. There were only two people. You know, you talk oh. about sort of knowledge and experience. I was in C Company 3 Power at that point, you know, as, as one of the section commanders. Uh, and there were only two people in our whole platoon who'd been to Northern Ireland. Two. That was it. It's all brand new. Everybody else, brand spanking new. In the company, Sergeant Major OC. You know, the platoon commanders have been, you know, and all the all the different platoons would, would struggle to have any more than, you know, what we had. So, you know, the turnaround in that time, like I said, I was a corporal by that point. You know, I've been in, you know, that was 1988. So, yeah, I've been in, you know, eight years by that point. Uh, but no one had been. But we didn't go anywhere. The, the next operation, really, we went on was, was, was two I was with two power then. I went to uh, Macedonia. You know, and it was, uh, and, you know, Slightly just before that, I think you went to to three power went to Kosovo. Yeah, Macedonia was, was two thousand and two. Two thousand. Two thousand was it? Yeah, two thousand. We went to uh, Afghanistan the first time. Two power went to Afghanistan the first time in two thousand two. Nah, Macedonia wasn't two thousand. Hundred percent. Well, two thousand one then. Yeah, it must be. It was definitely two thousand one. Two thousand two. We went to we went to Afghanistan the first time on the peace That's right, yeah. uh, op. But, you know, I mean, it's a long time. And, you know, while I'm talking about that, that period, I mean, I've got, you know, we're in a situation now where we could be in a similar sort of vein where there's, there's no operations out ongoing. That's why it's good that, you know, two power are now in Afghanistan. I know they're shortly coming back. But we, the one thing we had when, when we finished, you know, the Falklands, we had a bit of Northern Ireland bouncing around still. Some of the, the other battalions, you know, one and three power at the time, they were bouncing out in Northern Ireland and lots of other units all the time, you know, just so happens we didn't go. Um, but the one thing we had on our side is we had a, a massive amount of resources. We had a lot, of, a lot of money knocking around for training. We had aircraft coming out of our yin-yang. We were doing like 10, 15 parachute jumps a year. You know, we were jumping into exercise, during exercise, out of exercise. And um, when I look at you know, what the platoons have got now, what the battalions have got, and the restrictions they've got on training with ammunition, training areas, you know, trying to keep the blokes busy uh, with none of them operations on the on the horizon must be must be bloody hard work. You know, so platoon commanders, platoon sergeants, you know, company commanders and sergeant majors have got, got their work cut out to keep the blokes interested because once they get bored, they start walking and sort of talking with their feet, don't they? So, yeah, uh, you've got to be, you've got to be really, you've got to be really innovative with it. It's yeah. really hard. It's, re uh, it's really hard to try and keep Blokes, see, keeping blokes busy is one thing, and then but keeping the morale up is an entirely different beast. You know, yeah. if I want to go and keep the blokes busy, oh, I tell you what, let's do our mats. Let's get preparation for our mats. Let's do our med training again. Let's do our flipping. Yeah. What was it? They got sixty mil mortar now. Sixty. Yeah, they got them. Yeah, yeah six. Let's yeah. do mortar training now. Let's do this now. Let's do the, all this, all the same stuff we've been doing. But yeah. It doesn't keep morale up, and and but but. but a lot of times, to keep morale up when you're in the situation you got, you're completely limited unless you got the money to yeah. to throw at it. It's really, it's really hard, really hard. It's, it must and, be difficult. And again, yeah. going back to those peaks and troughs, I think the most challenging times, as you as you think from saying earlier, the, the most challenged times, the most challenging times for recruitment and retention within the forces is off peak, as in. When there's no ops going on, which is what we're in now. It's a, it's a nightmare. I like it's the worst time to be in. <laughs> yeah, the worst time to be in. Well, it is, but uh, I would I would say that you know now with what's going on right at this moment, it's a good time to be in the army. 
you know, because uh, there's a lot of people in very sort of, you know, difficult positions with finances and companies and, you know, various businesses, etc. that, you know, uh, haven't got the security that being in the forces offers. And that's what, you know, it, uh, that's, that's it, a has, good point. it has its benefits. That's a good point, actually. That's the one thing. You've got job security, but on the flip side, I, I, the, what the forces do now, is certain element of the forces with supporting the COVID-19 response, it's been amazing. I, I would have, I mean, to have been a part of something like that when I was in, not just the OT side, but to be able to do something back in the UK is, is completely different. The closest I ever got to that was OT flipping fresco, mate, OT fiasco in like end of oh, 02, you know, when so the firefighters went So the fireman thing? Yeah. Mate, fireman. we were meant to be training for the Iraq war. Like for that Iraq invasion, and then end of end of uh, 2002, we're replacing the firefighters. Hey, I mean well, that was I mean it was interesting, but at the same time you go what <laughs> in your green goddesses? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember uh, those green goddess flipping fire engines? I remember in three para, <laughs> so we go out like we get called out to go and like fight these fight. I remember going to call the Canby Island. And so, we turn up somewhere. It's, I remember turning up another place, and it was like it was someone's garage, you know. And uh, they, they, they're, uh, you know, the garage on the side of their house. I mean, it was on fire. We opened the, didn't open the door up. We went to fight the fire with this green goddess. It might as well be pissing on the fire. This thing, the, the, the power on the uh, on the hose. It was like a garden hose. And opened the door up, and it was all uh, like you know the high, like the, the six foot, five foot high gas canisters, yeah. full of it, full of it. And then, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember about a month later, the, the, the bedding store went on fire in three para in high. Oh yeah, I remember that. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. yeah, we had two, we had two green goddesses trying to put it out. They couldn't do it. <laughs> Brilliant. I always, I always remember the list of kit that was in there. That was some building, wasn't it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the bedding store full of mattresses, and then yeah. it gets burnt down. Uh, yeah, there was um, TV. I remember, and there was. <laughs> I always remember there was a there was a guy who had his motorbike in there, and he had to run in. He ran past the fireman, didn't he, and pulled his motorbike out. <laughs> God, I'm like, oh, dear. Yeah. What was? Uh, tell me about the the the. I mean, we're well over time here. Yeah, I know we are. Yeah, yeah. I knew. No, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's fine. I I know you. I know you can talk. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> um, aftermath, coming back, what was that like? Uh, if I'm honest, I don't remember an awful lot about it. I remember we got sent on leave for a long time because um, uh, they, they weren't going to repatriate the bodies. There was a lot of talk on the way down. You know, that anybody who died on the way down, you'd be buried at sea or, you know, you know if it came to that. And, uh, or buried, you know, down there on the on the Falklands. But it was later decided that if any of the families wanted their body, wanted the bodies to come back, they could. So they did repatriate them. Um, so we went on leave initially for a couple of weeks, uh, and then went back to work. Uh, and then during that period, when when the bodies started coming back, there was lots of funerals sort of taking place. Uh, and then they sent us on leave again. I mean, if I remember rightly, and we were on leave for something like uh, five, six weeks. You know, we'd been away for I think two weeks initially. And then we got sent again for another five, six weeks after that. I think it gave us an opportunity to spend that extra pound a day we got while we were down there. Like, you know, and, and all the wages that we you know, saved up. So, uh, it, uh, but no, that, that was it really. I mean, I, we very quickly, we went back to normal. Yeah, we started doing, you know, carders. You know, I, you know, I joined, I went and did the mortar carder. You know, I did the last mortar carder in 1982, sort of later on in that year after the, after the summer. Uh, uh, and, and moved to the mortar platoon you know, at the end of 1982. So we just got back and got on with it. It was it was great. There were there were some of the members of the battalion. I think mainly B Company going around giving talks and giving you know things down at on on the command courses and to Sandhurst and places like that. You know for a you know what I think what they call them lessons learnt now. It's um yeah and just trying to get something out of it. It was uh, it was a a steady old period if I remember rightly. But then before before very long. It was business as usual. Mm. Yeah. I was going to ask you a question. It's gone straight out of my head. The hell was it? Uh, oh, that's right. Did have you ever spoken to, engaged with any Argentinians who were there at the same time in, in the Falklands? No, I haven't. No. no. Would you? Uh, yeah, of course I would. Yeah. yeah it's, do you know what? It's like I said. You know, it's a, it's it's the job you choose, isn't it? You know, it's. Uh, you know, and they chose the job. Well, I suppose the conscripts didn't choose the job, but you know, it's, it, it was one of those things that came up. And it's, I always say about the army, 
and you get what you get when you're in. You know, and you know, you, you turn up, and, you know, and there's people there who didn't do much, you know, when they were in the army. Uh, and there's other people that, like me, I, I you know, I went places because I stayed in a long time, you know. But if you joined the army at the end of 1982, uh, you could have done the best part of a full military career without going many places at all. And that's the same for any foreign army, you know. And, and during that time, you get what you get. And if, you know, if you're willing to go to the cash point and collect the money at the end of the month, you go where you're told. And you don't start asking questions about, you know, should we be there? Because you probably have the same question. You know, should we have been in Iraq? You know, should we be fighting in Afghanistan? Hey, mate, you know, if I didn't think I should, I wouldn't, I'd feel bad going and collect my money at the end of the month out the cash point. It's so, a really good point. It's yeah. a really good point. I, I think, um, I, 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 yeah, I've spoken this before. It's a really good point. It's that my opinion on that is if he, the time, the time to question the morality of what you're doing is not when you is when you when we're talking about serving now is yeah. not when you're doing it and and it doesn't for, for me anyway I always I it was a, I almost a conscious thing predominantly subconscious almost a conscious thing I never tried to I never looked in depth at the why's and wherefores of why we're here I also didn't have the knowledge I, I didn't understand like politics level you know even the afghan chores bear in mind my last one was like 2011 finished 2011 my first tour was um like a proper tour was iraq in 2003 yeah i, I never allowed myself to question morality of it and yeah. i think the reason was because if i question the morality of it then by definition i'm in that i'm in iraq okay i'm in iraq or even northern ireland i'm there already if i start questioning it, i don't believe in what i'm doing I'm not going to perform to the way I need to perform. And my performance is a direct has a direct impact on the likelihood of my survival. <laughs> yeah. Right? So so don't question it. The time after, yes. You know, my time since I've I've reflected and everything. I, I don't um, yeah. you know, I don't uh, look back at things and go I, I look I don't look back at things and go, Oh, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have done this. Or we shouldn't have been there or, yeah. or I shouldn't have been there because I don't believe we should have been there. You act on you act on the information you know at the time, yeah. and if and you do that in good faith and you do it with honest intentions, then that's absolutely yeah. fine. You know, I absolutely don't agree with some of the things I was involved in back in the day. It doesn't mean I was wrong then; it just means yeah. I have more knowledge now. I have a, and I have a different understanding now. Yeah. Um. So it's a really yeah, it's a really inter- really interesting point you said there, mate. I, it would be great to line up a, an Argentinian for this. <laughs> well, I tell you, I know a bloke who who did go. He went out to Argentina and did a. I've got Argentine family. I've got Argentine family. Have you? Yes, mate. This is not yeah. where you. Br- it's not where you bring him out now. And so do you. <laughs> you haven't seen him since 1982. Mate, <laughs> honest to God, no. I've got Argentine family, right? Listen to this. So, uh, my 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 mother's Irish, my, my as in uh, Air uh, Republic, and my dad's Scottish. My mother's brother, he's dead now, bless him, Uncle Mike. He went out. Uh, he wanted to become a priest because he. He's an alcoholic. I don't know because or whatever. And anyway, he went to Argentina, got married. He's got free wine. Yeah, he sacked the priesthood off, and uh, <laughs> and he, anyway, he ended up having two wives in Argentina and, he, and a bunch of cousins. So um, in fact, one of one of them has been a guest on the podcast. Right. Yeah. And if I uh, so fe- she fe- they feel and so I got two female. No, I got three female cousins of Argentinian. Yeah. Uh, one of them, so the middle one, Ilu, she, when we first started talk, when, when she became an adult kind of thing, or, you know, she, she's younger than me, and we started going to the piss and stuff, but she kept she wanted to get to study, we talk about it, and then her younger sister, who's called Brenda, oh, I hope won't mind me fucking talking about it now, but we didn't know each other, I knew her when she was a kid, we wouldn't remember each other, and when she became an adult, she found out that her older sister, Ilu, was talking to me, a British soldier, he's like, why the fuck are you talking to him? Because Ilu told me this, and she's like, what? Why the fuck are you talking to him? He's a British soldier. Bear in mind, I'm a cousin. <laughs> Ilu's like, he's a nice guy. <laughs> like, what? And then uh, it, Brenda didn't talk to me, mate, until she ended up coming to the UK to see my mum, because they, they, they're they Irish. It's all right. And uh, we ended up becoming friends but before that. I mean, that's a generation, you know, two generations below you. 
yeah generation and a half below me and they're like no falklands malvinas it's ours and they hate the american snake <laughs> mad mad i i can banter i can banter with yeah. my, i can banter with her about the falklands and i do i i ribber all the time yeah every opportunity i get to bring up the falklands i bring it up and she will fly off if i push her the right button she'll fly off the handle about it Flat but it's hours. But, oh, Jesus fucking Christ, man. Yeah. I mean, like you said, again, the politics, mate. Yeah. I don't care. At the time, it was decided we were going to go down there and do something about, you know, some foreigners that had taken over a bit, a bit of, a little bit of England, a thousand miles yeah. away. And we went and did it. And when you it, go there, you do the bit, your best you can. You know, you do what you have to do. You know, the rest of it, you know, it's all like lots of hearts and minds, feeding kids, giving them toys, like doing collections for them, all that sort of stuff. You know, people don't see that bit, do they? And uh, but you, you, you take you take your money, you do the job. But mate, politics aside, I mean, the the politics aside, it's like, so I think with anything, I mean, we, God, we are the most guilty. If depending on which way you look at it, we are one of the, one of the most guilty nations in the world. Colonizing everywhere, fucking shit up, just ruling the world, right? But when you look at, I mean, let's take the Falklands for example, or you could take, you could take Northern Ireland as another example, right? There is no solution, and the reason I say this is that it, the Argentinians can lay claim to the Falklands as much as they want, and they maybe they're entirely right. We can lay as much claim to the Falklands as we want. Maybe we're entirely right. Okay, let's say the Argentinians are entirely right. We completely rob them of it. Not the case, but let's say we did, right? It is irrespective. It doesn't matter. It's, it's like inconsequential because what really matters now, when we're talking about now, is the people in the Falklands, the people in Northern Ireland, the people in the Falklands. It's not their fault that the UK can't be in, in, in holding it, and now they are British, and that's their way of life. What's this? there's no solution to it? What? Oh, okay. Let's give it back to Argentina. How does that work? You don't just turn the British Argent into Argentinians. Yeah. Regardless of the UK, regardless of Argentina, you're fucking a whole nation, okay, whatever that nation is, Falklands in this case, yeah, you're messing up their whole existence, everything they believe in. They don't yeah. believe in it because they're bastards. They believe in it because we were born into. You can't change it. So the, yeah. it's like the argument's irrelevant. It doesn't care what UK wants. It doesn't matter what Argentina wants. It's what the Falklands believe themselves to be. Yeah. You know, you've, if, you've, you've also got to ask yourself, you, why would they want it? Why would they? What's down there that they want? You know, what you know, is it? Because this goes this goes on for years, and I don't know the Argent the, the history of the Falklands with the Argentinians and who who had it. I know it's changed hands a few times. You know, but at the end of the day, you know, why do they want it? Why do they make such a big thing about it? I, I, I don't well, get that. Well, I, I think in terms of I, I did briefly when I, when I was discussing one of my I, I had a discussion with one of my RG cousins, Ilu. Afterwards, I did briefly go, right, who had it before us? And I think it started off, like, as a French colony or Spanish. It wasn't yeah, that who had it first. Maybe the French or Spanish were I can't remember. I'm butchering that. But yeah. um, why do they want it? I mean, look, the fact of the matter is Argentina. We are getting the weeds now. And we'll have yeah. to close this off in a minute. Good, time to go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Argentina has been financially, or well, no, not just financially, but unstable for at least 20 Beyond 20 years. I went there in 1997 to go out and visit my uncle and auntie and my cousins. Um, and it was unstable then. They have got dramas going on, you know, as much as South America does. Yeah. And one of the classic things when you've got a country going on is you try and divert the attention away to something, an age-old thing that divide, that that is a, just a focus of attention. I think that is repeatedly what happens to the Falklands. Yeah. Whichever, is in, whichever uh, entity is in power in Argentina... Well, let's bring up the Malvinas again, bring yeah, it to attention. Yeah. Plus, then you've got the oil. Mate, there's a million reasons. Plus, you've got, you got the oil reserves. Plus, you've got the proximity to the, to the, um, the, the just the, uh, the uh, position of, in the South Atlantic. Yeah. You've got just, just loads of stuff, you know, loads of stuff. Yeah. But, I mean, there, it does. there's got to be something there. There's got to be something there, that the reason they want it. You know, it can't be just a political thing, you know. And don't get me wrong, Margaret Thatcher used it as a political thing to get back in power. Yeah, it was a great thing. It did it did the British Army and us as a regiment, you know, and other regiments a lot of, lot of good. Yeah, you know, we lived off that for a long time. And but I don't, I, I, I just can't see that anybody would use that now as a political, you know, let's make the people feel good about ourselves and get that back. Because, uh, you know, I dare say we'd put together another gang to go down and sort of sort that <laughs> again. 
<laughs> <That's a gap>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to finish it off. But yeah. be, John, right. do, do you know what could fill another entire podcast? I reckon, which will never happen. So all these sneaky little stories on the uh, on the boat on the way to Falklands and on the way oh, back. Yeah. I've heard some. T- yeah. I've heard some tales. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. There's a massive fight on the way back on the Norland between two and three part. That was that was epic. That was. Yeah. Do you know what? Do you know what caused it? Oh, I don't know. I I haven't got a clue. It was uh, it just it just all it was like a wild west brawl. It was just unbelievable. Yeah, and it all then died down, and everyone just started drinking again. It was, it was great. Yeah, <laughs> it was like in true Reg fashion. Yeah. There you go, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Hey, yeah, we've gone on for quite a long time, mate. Sorry about that. It's uh, this is uh, no, it's officially the longest podcast I've done. Is it? Oh no, I feel yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Don't feel bad. Well, sort of. Like Steve Heaney, we ended up getting close to time, but I was in the studio, so I had no option to go over time because I just <laughs> get kicked out because he had, he had someone else coming in. But uh, no, mate, it's been. I really enjoyed that conversation, but really enjoyed it. Well, thanks I, for the uh, offer, mate. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. It was good. No, so, I appreciate the time. Appreciate your time. And uh, I'll be on to uh, I'll be on to Reg HQ to uh, to try and get some links into an RG. <laughs> I'll put. <laughs> I'll put you in touch with someone who might know one, all right? Yeah, definitely, mate, cool. Yeah. Happy days. Cheers, buddy. Hey, cheers, you. Hey, in fact, no. Very much. In fact, no, 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 no. In fact, oh, uh, yeah. um, any shout-outs you want to do, links, anyone you want to mention? Uh, no, I, well, well, if I could just mention the uh, sort of regimental um, association. Uh, I think, you know, over the years, you know, things like the Royal British Legion uh, and other smaller units, you know, they've, they've uh, been hit pretty hard with people not getting involved in regimental associations. Uh, and I, part of my job is, you know, with the Parachute Regimental Association. Uh, and we've taken on board a couple of the smaller sort of groups. Uh, and all I can say to everybody is get involved, you know, because it's not going to change and it's not going to be brought into the, you know, the 21st century. And uh, until, you know, people people do take uh, take part and offer some advice and, and, and become part of it. We, we've got a great brand. We've got a great brand in the Parachute Regiment and Airborne Forces. And uh, and we need some good guys, and there's lots of them out there who uh, who could help. And that's who's, uh, who's, edu- who's eligible to join the Par- Parachute Regimental Association? Uh, any member of the Parachute Regiment, Airborne Forces, ideally, you know, if they've gone through um, a P Company, done you know, normal P Company through you know, depot or all arms P Company. Um, and then subsequently joined or not joined, uh, if they didn't get that far or didn't, you know, their job didn't det- entail it, uh, joining an airborne unit. So uh, have a look at the website, uh, just Google Parachute Regimental Association, uh, and you'll find us. And you can join if you're, if you're attached to an airborne unit, right? Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's different, lots of different categories now, um, because, like I said, there are lots of other um, smaller organisations not having the opportunity to. Uh, uh, you know, have anywhere to meet. Like I said, British Legion's closing down, smaller units, uh, groups sort of closing. Uh, we opened our doors and we, we changed the uh, one to an armed forces membership. So you don't even have to have been parachute regiment, airborne forces, attached to an air yawn unit. You just turn up in your own gear, but you enjoy the banter that the armed forces offer and the social functions that can bring everyone with, uh, you know, like-minded experiences and, uh, and things to to work and uh, socialise together. Yeah, no, I've, obviously you know I'm part of it, and uh, mate, I love it. The bran- yeah. the branch I'm part of in Coventry, mate. Young guys, well, across a cross section of young and old. We got yeah, we got um, we know Gordon. We got Gordon is like two Gordon. days older, two days older than grass. And then you got we got guys who are still serving. You know, we got yeah. uh, we got guys who are still serving. Uh, part yeah, that's of it. good. And then we've also got um, Tony Lewis, who was yeah. never Power Edge. No. But uh, his but his son was power edge. Obviously, his son was killed. And uh, but Tony served. Yeah. No, mate. It's, yeah. Pa- uh, the, yeah. And again, not just power edge association. I think we I, people listen to this who aren't power edge. It's the same with any other associations. Get get amongst it. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Got to get amongst it. They're, they're, they're good to be part of. And, it's not going to grow if you don't get involved. And you know, with, I know people don't have to meet up now, but you've got to try and remember when you're talking about things like the. The PRA, the Power Edge Association, is, you know, in the old days, they had no choice. They meet up once a month. If I said to you, you, we're going to meet up. This is the date we're going to go. We had no way of getting in comms with each other, you know, to do anything other. 
you know, you will you'll meet some really interesting people. It's changed my attitude on old people, you know, doing the job I do now. I've had I've been very very fortunate to meet some very very good men who've done some pretty big shit in their times. So you know, it's a pleasure to talk to them and a pleasure to listen to their stories. And actually, yeah, you know, they want to hear your story as well. So mm, that's cool. Good. Mega. We'll end it on that. Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure. Hugh, thanks very much, mate. Pleasure. All right. Wait. Thanks a lot.